Hello, hello, hello. Welcome everybody uh, to the Unstoppable You, where we uh, get you unstuck so you can reclaim your power and create those happy relationships. Um, I'm Amy Shea. I am the host and the producer of The Unstoppable You. Um, I'm an empowerment coach that gives you the confidence and clarity to have an unstoppable, empowered life. Um, welcome, welcome. I see everyone's kind of coming on. Uh, so quickly tell me uh, where you are watching this from. I'm in Los Angeles. Um, I know we have a couple Californians on the panel with me today. I'm going to uh, let them. Hello, Dave. Hey um, I'm gonna go ahead here. There we go. And uh, so, tell us where are you where are you watching from? What where area of the country are you in, or or are you out of the country? Say hello to us. Um, post it in the comments and let us know you know you're here and that you're ready to participate. Um, so yeah, I'm Amy Shade. I'm an empowerment coach. Uh, this is the unstoppable you. You're in the right place if you want to reclaim uh, your power, uh, really create happy, loving relationships. And you know, this is um, I've done hmm, ten lives um, so far at the unstoppable you. So this is my eleventh. And those ten lives, we had a panel uh, panels with women. So I decided that you know it would be awesome to create an event. Um, with men only on it so that we can get their perspective, um, how they're thinking, um, how they do their business, how they run their uh, marriages, how they run their, their life. Because I think the men's perspective is so important and it's so beautiful. So yeah, I invited 18 minutes to uh, be with me over three days so we could speak on sex, we could speak on love, we could speak on um, business, courage, and really just hear their perspective of um, of what they're experiencing, especially during this time of, during COVID, um, as we're still coming out of COVID. But this is such a great opportunity for us to have 18 men over three days for you to ask your questions, to enjoy their gifts and perspectives. And these three days are going to be awesome. I'm excited and uh, for this event. But I do want to kind of reflect and speak into... You know, I, I'm sitting here with the anticipation and butterflies of excitement. But really, you know, I took a moment today to really ground into my why. Why Why was creating this event so important to me? You know, what was inside of me that inspired me to commit to 12 live events? So why? Well, you know, I remember I was standing alone in my living room and the sun was out, right? And COVID was in full force in LA. And in LA, everything was uh, shut down. I mean, silence on the streets, no traffic. I mean, totally unheard of in LA. And I sat there and I felt isolated. And then I, I sat there and I wondered, how many of us are out there sitting alone in our living rooms? Wondering what's next? How is this gonna all play out? Um, all of us were sitting there together in uncertainty in a major historical event. And I sat there wondering, am I going to be able to work? What's going to happen to my business? How will I pay my rent? What if I get sick? What is my life going to look like in isolation? And how will I come out of this? And I really sat there and connected to that uncertainty and that feeling of fear and loss. And But something is said, inside of me said, yes, but now what? And how was that line of questioning of fear going to help me and help others? So I began switching my line of questioning into how can I support people? How can I bring, build a community and connection during this time? 
how can I bring together a community of women who want to do better and be better, who want to find new ways of being? And I want to say that when we, as a collective, when we switch our questions out of fear and anxiety and out into how can we contribute in this world, new possibilities totally open up. And I stopped worrying about me. I created a vision for a show that was inclusive and collective, inspiring and fun. And if you know the show, uh, if you've seen this before, you know we love to laugh and we love to bring valuable insight and content. But really, we aim to show you that your voice matters. That's why we ask for you to pre-submit your questions. Uh, really to know that everyone heals differently. This is definitely not a cookie cutter forum. But really, we at The Unstoppable, uh, we really want you to know that you are not alone. And many of us uh, on the panel have experienced what you are experiencing today. And that we, t we together in this big world of ours, we can actually make a difference. So thank you for all your questions. You know, I'm going to try to get through all of them in the next three days uh, because we at The Unstoppable are here to answer your questions in real time and support you in change and actually create strategies that work right um so blow up the chat box so that we can support each other and keep your energy high and type yes to let us know if something really resonates from you uh with you because that keeps us totally excited and if you're watching on uh my youtube channel subscribe to it as I say, uh, let's stay connected. So let me ask uh, out there, where are you guys, uh, where are you guys uh, watching us from? Put in your city, country, say hello. Uh, are you in, uh, I get a lot of Austra people from New Zealand, Australia. And I want to ask you, you know, who here is seeking? to live a connected and empowered life. You know, when you feel good in your skin and you're, you're connected to the people you love and you wanna deepen your connection with self, who here is seeking to live that like connected, empowered life, that unstoppable life? Because we're here to foster that connection for you and for you to feel empowered. Um, and all of us on the panel today and in the community uh, of people of this live, we are happy you're here. We're happy to have you. We've been waiting for you. All right, Victoria's from Indiana. Indiana, nice. Tell me, Victoria. Are you really ready to uh, have a connected, empowered life where you have that deep connection with self and others? Put a yes. So what I want to do next is I want to introduce you to your experts for our first segment. So I'm going to take me out of here. Oh. Now you is from California. Yes, the sun is out in California, which has been um, a bit weird weather for us in California lately. So yeah, it's nice to have the sun out. All right, so I'm going to quickly introduce our speakers before we get into our interviews. Uh, make sure you put your questions in the chat box. I do have questions that you guys pre-submitted, but we are we are real, we are now, we are ready. So if you have a question, let us know. So we're gonna start with Dr. Gary. He's a transformational relationship mentor. Uh, he's a author, He's uh, he is in private practice. Um, he really focuses on heart-centered transformation, which we love, right? Uh, we love the heart. Um, so I'm excited to have you and for us to dive deep into to all of your insights and uh, expertise in the, the love department. And also Ken Foster. Ken Foster is a, a keynote speaker, a business strategist, and a syndicated radio host. 
of Voices of Courage show. Now, courage is so important um, in our life. I believe that uh, courageous action is uh, so important, not perfect action, but courageous action. Um, and he's a best-selling author of seven books. So he's got lots of uh, resources for you guys. So go ahead and ask him your questions as we get into uh, the interview. And then we have Dave Elliott, who's a relationship strategist and host of Why Haven't I Found Love Yet? And I know a, a podcast. And I know that many of you have um, those kind of questions. <laughs> like, what do what men want? How do I, as a woman, how do I get a man, right? Um, so he's a noted expert. He's an author and an international speaker. And he really um, helps uh women find love in their life. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and let's have a conversation with Dr. Gary. I'm super excited to um, have this time with you. So Dr. Gary, Hi, give, us, give us a little more introduction about yourself. Tell us um, about who you work with and, and what women and people, men also ex are experiencing right now in love and relationships. Okay, so uh, I call myself a, transformati a transformational relationship mentor. And that just means that I rewrite the rules of love in people's brains so that singles can have a loving partner beside them at night rather than that empty pillow staring at them. And so that couples can get past that, oh my God, here we go again, feeling the, either the distance or the argument. So they can get back to have the love they signed up for with each other. Um, well, right now, if we're talking about what people are going through uh, in general, uh, COVID, I think, has been um, a real wear and tear on all relationships, especially couples. Uh, I, I had more couples come to me last year than any time in, in the previous 13. Uh, and what surprised me was many, half of them were at the 30 or above mark, which I would have not have predicted until I thought about it a little more. And the big thing is that COVID has done something, you know, we all need to be able to go out and explore and then come back to the home port of somebody's heart, go out and explore singles and singles got all right to be separate. <laughs> they no right to really go out and connect. And it began to feel hopeless. Uh, on the other hand, couples, they got all right to belong. They, you know, they were under each other's feet 24 seven and it's, and that habitual thing that might have come up once or twice a day is now coming up 20 times. And without that space for me, and it's all we, uh, if there's a we at all, um, it superheated a lot of couples. So in generally, and then I think as we go forward, we've all been so isolated and afraid of common connection that our brains have been wired to fear common human connection. And we're going to have to help our brains get over that. Uh, because um, every, you know, we've always been afraid. Well, who's that person beside us? You know, instead of, we can't even smile at each other through our masks. So I think we've got a year or two of adjustment, get, allowing ourselves a full right to connect again. Yeah. And I think one of the things you just said was, um, it's kind of like give yourself some space mm -hmm. to, you know, um, because we have, I mean, couples have gone through some really, uh, jarring experiences with each other, whether it's like we are working from home now, the kids are home, it's stressful. And I know a lot of kids aren't back at school yet. So how, how can you help us be more patient <laughs> with that, with that new um, relationship and understanding and connection? What would you recommend for us to, you know, really help with that? Well, if we're talking about going forward, you know, uh, our, all of our, our brains have been wired to see danger everywhere. We we get there's this virus and you don't know who's got it and uh, is someone bringing it in? And the and what we know it's turned on all of our 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 what I call our danger brains, right? You can call it your sympathetic nervous system if you'd like, right? Uh, but we've got these stress hormones and we're always looking around for where is the danger, how we can't connect. Once you had a year of that, a year and a half of that, your brain has been grooved and it's going to fire off those same feelings of fear or dread 
or uh, you know, I'm not quite sure if it's safe. Um, we're going to have to ease our brains back in. We're going to have to do some things that actively calm our nervous systems. And we're going to have to allow ourselves to gradually allow ourselves to hug again without feeling, oh, my God, am I violating somebody's space? You know, could I get something? Uh, that just happened the other night. I was meeting somebody and you could see the hesitance in the hug, even though we were both fully vaccinated. It was like, and we were, and we've known each other for 10 years. And it was just that, that initial moment. And attachment wise, your brain sees that as, oh man, am I doing something wrong? Is there a connection here? Where there is, but there's another part of our brain that's getting in the way and it's right. It's good. It's been useful, but we're going to have to help it chill. That's what I think. Yeah. Yeah. Because yes, it is. It's very, um, you know, it's interesting because, and it's also creating, um, really letting us to use our voice and what we're comfortable with and not comfortable with, especially in dating, right? Yes. Like what we're able to say in front. So I think it's been a growing experience for people to really use their voice also about boundaries and what, what they're okay with and what they're not okay with. Yeah. You know, one of the things that uh, uh, if you look at where we're at in a relationship, in general, you know, we, we live in a culture that's not really relationship friendly. There's all the pressures and, and the, se the emphasis on self-development when real love is a we. Real love is two people creating something that's bigger than themselves. Uh, and even in COVID, I mean, I, I, what I talk about in my book is that love when you feel love, there's basically four feelings your brain has been wired to feel since you were, you know, one to three, okay? You know, and we've got to learn to give those feelings again because COVID has done all sorts of things with it. Uh, you know, when you're in a relationship and you feel loved, you naturally feel welcome with joy. That's when you, you know, like, it's so great to see you again, Amy, you know, and Ken and Dave. That's that's welcome with joy. When you wake up in the mornings and, and you hear that, good morning, gorgeous, or good morning, handsome, that's welcome with joy, right? And, you know, with mask on and, you know, that's not been exactly there. Uh, the second feeling is worthy and nourished to, to reach out for your need. That's a feeling that it's okay to reach out for my needs and and to know that I'll, I can receive and I can give right back. Well, in, in COVID, how many of us have felt truly worthy to get over our needs now? <laughs> you know, we've been isolated. It's been hard, you know, and all that. So uh, especially if you're isolated, you don't feel worthy anymore because who's there to reach out to if you're having to socially isolate, right? It's a hard thing because it's about reaching out. The other feeling is cherished and protected where you get to be a me in a way. You get to go out and explore and then to come back to the home port of somebody's heart. And like I said, COVID took that feeling right, you know, down to the mat, <laughs> you know, oh, you got all right to be a me if you're single and all right to be a we. But uh, in a beautiful relationship, somebody sees your essence and they are committed to that essence. And there's something in you they can't find elsewhere. So, yes, they go out and explore the world, but they can't wait to come back and create a unity, a bond, a partnership with you and to rest inside the home of each other's heart. And then there's just what we're talking about on this on, on this telesummit. There's empowered with choice. Empowered means I have a right to have a voice. I have a right to create my own experience. The other partner is not the sole standard of what we need to do. We're co-creating, and we get to be the standard of our own in a in a sphere of partnership that co-creates. So, it, as we go forward, I think you know, in all relationships, the key is. If you're whether you're single and you're dating somebody new or you're in a couple and you're wondering what's off, you know, you just do a scale of one to ten. How how one to ten, how welcomed with joy do I feel? One to ten, how worthy and nourished do I feel? One to ten, how cherished and protected do I feel? And one to ten, how worthy, I mean, how empowered with choice and voice. If you're dating somebody and those feelings are pretty low. Probably not a good choice. Doesn't matter if they're, you know, they're, you know, six foot two and, uh, you know, they've got a doctor's or uh, uh, or something like that. 
you know, I, I don't know how many uh, women I've heard say, I found a doctor and he's 6'2 and he wears Armani shoes and all these other things. And then six weeks, weeks, they're complaining, yeah, yeah, he does yoga. He likes to check out all the other women. <laughs> no, not so cherished and protected, even if he is six foot two and looks like Pierce Brosnan, right? <laughs> You know? Guilty, guilty sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> or the couples, they say, I, we don't know what's off. But as soon as they do that check-in, they go, you know, we don't welcome each other with joy. We just go right on our cell phones and we act as if the other one isn't in the room. You know, or there's no, I don't feel cherished. I don't know they're going to have my back. Mm -hmm. These feelings, if we can concentrate on the feelings and, in, in, and we empower them and we reclaim them and we have a right to give and receive them, you can empower singles to find the right person. You can, and you can empower couples to restore that love or to know that it's not possible. But with me, about 85% of couples, once you give them the, their brains a right to feel safe, give them those four feelings with each other, they naturally choose love again. So these are the feelings that make you unstoppable in love, welcomed, worthy, cherished, and empowered. To give them and to receive them. It's got to be a two-way street. Yeah, and that's where uh, that's where it comes up against this wall, right? Because it is a two-way street. Yes. And, uh, you know, what if your partner is not, you know, on board with you on those ideas or those wants and those desires? Because I know a lot of us, uh, a lot of women in my audience are in relationships where they don't feel cherished, embraced. They don't feel those things. Yes. So would you, what would you, you know, do, what would you be, would, would be your recommendation for women in that situation um, when, yeah, I mean, they're ready for it to be embraced and cherished. I mean, aren't we all right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so how would you, because. Uh, I know there's some men on here, but most of us are women usually. So, but the men were speaking to you also. But how can women um, motivate men to to want to cherish and love us, and to how to open that up for us? Motivate would not be the word. I mean, cherish. <laughs> if you're a man and you're listening to this, uh, cherish may not resonate with you, but I bet respected and honored. Okay, but cherished is a general term of somebody, you see somebody precious. Well, let's look at this. Motivation, you know, the title of my book is Safe to Love Again. It's not motivated. It's not guilt tripped. <laughs> it's right. not killed to death. You can give people skills. Like, let's. What happens is whenever we weren't given one of these four feelings, usually in early childhood, we have to have all four to feel securely loving and lovable. Okay. Say we're, you know, I, I, I deal with this couple in um, chapter six of my book, Todd and Jennifer, and neither of them knew how to give cherished and love for each other mm -hmm. for different reasons. It, cherished wasn't really safe because neither of them had felt they didn't have a right to feel cherished. So they chose each other because when they didn't feel cherished, they didn't get a right to feel cherished in a relationship. So they chose someone who gave them exactly the rights they had. In every relationship, we are, when I talk about these, these natural given rights that we're supposed to have in relationships, we're always having the relationship we have the rights for. She grew up in a child, uh, uh, in a family where uh, they were not very cherishing. She always had to be independent, be a tomboy, really you know <laughs> and and she, no matter and they were always moving they were always busy she never had a place and she, so she never felt very cherished and protected and the part of her that was anxious said i'm going to lock this down when i get i want a relationship i'm going to be cherished me but she didn't have the right for it so she marries a guy who who didn't feel very cherished either except for the opposite reason instead of being told that she had to be a separate, separate, separate. He had this very intrusive mother who parked herself right there. And, and so he was always wanting to get away, get away, right? Uh, how can I create my own experience too? So, so now we've got a couple in which she's coming in, trying to make sure she's cherished. And that's his worst nightmare. So he pulls away and he pulls away in a very conscious way. I'm going to go do a retreat. I'm going to do yoga. I'm going to go to Wayne Dyer, right? <laughs> Which is driving her nuts, right? And when, and then when, and so when she pulls in and then when he pulls away, she gets her worst nightmare. 
Now we can motivate them, but what if we allow him to feel safe with in a relationship so it's okay? He's not going to be an intruded upon. It's safe to allow someone in. You don't have to do this by doing conscious retreats. And what if we could calm her down so that she didn't have to pursue him so much she scared the wits out of him? Now they're both empowering and cherishing. When they are safe, giving that feeling to each other in non-intrusive ways and non-avoidant ways, suddenly they spiral upwards. You can give them the skills and now they'll stick because if you show them skills to be in a we and the we feels dangerous, that part says, well, I don't know I want that skill set. So you have, you have to give them that feeling. It's safe to be cherishable again. Then they can do it, and then you give the skills. So it's not quite motivation. It's restoring these natural feelings so our brain naturally wants it because every feeling is a motivational state. Yeah, it's so, yeah, so uh, thank you for that. So one of our audience members asked, they, you know, how to get more depth and in intimacy with their partner. And it's interesting as you're speaking about that, it's like, it'd be nice to kind of look back and look at your four things and maybe how it's not working together. So what would you, you know what I'm saying? Yes. Yes. You know, so you know, are we asking, are you asking about what it takes to have intimacy or what, uh, what what's the, I'm not quite sure what the question is. Well, I think that, sh I think because we want more intimacy with our partner. Mm -hmm. Like we want more depth and in intimacy. Yes. But from the, your four aspects, we might be going around about it the wrong way. That's causing the friction. Yes. So how could she or he, let me double check. <laughs> how can she, yeah. How can she start to like, question her own her own um maybe her own ideas of maybe she wasn't cherished or maybe she wasn't empowered or like how could she pull back a little bit and like and kind of assess her own experience okay. so then sh maybe she can check that out have one a little the, more insight okay yeah one of the things i do with clients is mm -hmm. i i kind of do a check-in with you know what's going on now and i'm listening for what's, what is the missing key feeling? Sometimes, are they not feeling worthy? Or they don't feel so welcomed? And then I say, so what, what about earlier relationships? Did you ever feel that the same way? Oh yeah, and you start looking for the pattern and then you go, oh, was that familiar? Was that a familiar feeling way back in childhood? Oh yeah, you know, you know, I was never worthy. Every time I ever asked for something, mom would say, oh, you're just being selfish, you know? Um, and pretty soon, and then you find out in all their relationships, they found men that were takers. <laughs> and in their current relationship, they don't feel a, a real right to, rate or the, to, act, to ask for their needs. The way you look at it is if you're going to restore it, you go, what is driving the bus? So I never felt worthy. And I chose people that would not give that back. In every relationship, you know, if you don't feel worthy, you'll find someone that doesn't give to you or is sort of a taker because you'll never write to receive. If you feel disempowered, you'll find someone who's a dominator or you will naturally lose yourself in that relationship, whether they want you to or not. You know, this is why I hear people that say, well, I changed religion because they're this. And then in, in five years later, they changed, you know, they changed pol policy, you know, politics because they're dating somebody else. And they're that comedian. Well, and then they wonder, I never feel love because they don't have a right to create their own experience. So the key thing is to restore those feelings in yourself and to in, and to make sure you've chosen someone who has the ability to give it back. And then to and, and then you in a really good loving relationship, you are inviting each other. Uh, and somebody naturally chooses. To cherish you, you know, when you've chosen someone who truly loves you, they see an essence in you that they can't find elsewhere. That's when love gets committed. When there's something about that your beloved that yes, they could be six two or they could be you know blonde or you know gorgeous or you know successful, but there's that little way they sing in the shower that just lights you up. There's that little way they greet you in the morning. There's the little ways they do this and that, and you find that precious. And if you can't find it elsewhere, that's what leads to commitment. Intimacy is all about giving and taking these four feelings and feeling safe. Uh, 
believe me, you're, you know, it's not just sometimes people don't feel comfortable receiving. I once had a woman that didn't feel worthy because between laughter, the, her mother literally drugged her from seven to 18 to make sure that she was sickly so that she she needed to be at her house most time rather than the split situation in a divorce. Mm. And once she found out she was being drugged, she had a horrible time taking. You could, Now, if we restore that right to be able to receive, then our partner isn't saying, what do you do when you have a, a, a wife that doesn't think she has any needs? He was frustrated. He wanted to give to her. But so it's, but it was that feeling of it's not safe to receive. That would be still be unworthy. So in these, all these situations, it's noticing the, the feeling, restoring the feeling. It's feelings. Mm -hmm. then, and then especially that feeling of power, I can create a new experience. Of all the feelings that I think I like the best, if someone doesn't feel empowered that they can create a new experience, that they can restore a feeling of welcomed or worthy, they won't do it. You've got to know that somewhere you're empowered to create a different future. Whenever we lack that feeling of empowerment, if we don't think we can create a better future, that's when we feel depressed or hopeless. And I, I, I want to speak into something you just said, because 10 lives later, this is my 11th live, right? It's like many of us women feel vulnerable to ask for what we want. This is, we, it feels like if we ask for what we want, mm -hmm. it really puts us in a vulnerable place. And we're afraid of the rejection. Many women are afraid of rejection. So if we ask and we're rejected, it's really painful for us. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's like it hits us to the core because, well, because when we came out as little girls where they're like, no, you can't have that. No, yeah. you have to be quiet. No, just did that, right? So when we ask for something we truly want and desire, it's scary for us. It is. That's just how. That's true. So how? What would you? How would you help us? Well, <laughs> I, I'll be honest with yes. you. Uh, what I've just noticed over the years that more women have a missing right to have their needs, to have their needs met. They uh, unworthy shows up all the time. Part of it is just the gendered aspect of of being. Uh, uh, you know, born female, where you, you're, a, you know, you're a giver of life. You have to give that nurturing role in it. And culture sort of skews it. It's another way that culture isn't very friendly. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, in the book, I talk about Gwen, who, who grew up in a, um, a family where the mother was always saying, oh, honey, you don't make it always about yourself. Don't always make it about it. Never worth it. And then after the divorce, there was this incident where the father, at, I think she was eight or nine, was very resentful about the divorce, uh, how much he had to pay in child support. And they went out on a visit on a Saturday and she asked for an ice cream cone. I mean, you know, are there any newspapers? And then and I have a bold headline, child asked for ice cream cone. That's not news, right? And and he pulls out a, a wad of bills and says, this is what you cost me every month. And from that, she learned to never have her needs met again. So, and and the funny thing about this was she also had um, some anemia uh, where her body just wouldn't take in vitamins no matter what the medical mu community uh, did, okay? And she couldn't figure it out. They couldn't figure it out. When we went back and helped her feel safe to feel worthy again, and she felt worthy, she not only started picking men who would actually give to her, she came in one day and said, I don't know why, but my anemia has gone away. Her body had a right to receive at a cellular level. Why? Because she felt worthy. And it, and it's, and it really is restoring the feeling. Uh, we could have given her all sorts of skill sets on how to ask and you know, nonviolent communication on receiving and all that feedback wheel stuff. But if she doesn't feel worthy, she was setting up, I'm not going to take again. Um, it's in, If you're out there, just track those feelings. What's the missing feeling for your entire life? Welcomed? Or did you feel unwelcomed, unworthy, not so cherished and protected, or disempowered? And if that's always been there, it's like a groundhog day that keeps rolling and rolling and rolling over and over again. 
I bet you can track it back to childhood. And then it's about allowing yourself to feel safe to do it and restoring the actual feeling. Sometimes people are, have felt unworthy for so long or not so cherished, they don't even know what it feels like. You kind of have to work at it. But if you have those feelings, then you know your brain will start to naturally choose because all feelings are motivational states. If feelings had words, they would only have two, yes or no. So if in the brain's natural way of motivating you for a, a beautiful, intimate, safe love is, is to have, to reach out. Uh, yes. And I, I, yeah. And I just want to say that when you told that story with the father with the money and the ice cream cone, I think, you know, whether in the replay or you're hearing it now, that hits us so hard. Yes. Like that, when you said that, I was like, Phew. You know, that's such, uh, I think many women out there can really relate to those times in I've our had life. Four, I've had four clients tell me a virtual clone of the same story who are all women. Mm. The resentment of the father about the child payment. And, you, mm. and I was struck, you know, a, a virtual clone of the same story. So I know it's, that type of story is more prevalent out there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the big thing is to know you have a, you were born, you, you were born worthy. No one, you know, you were born with these innate rights. You don't have to do something to earn to be worthy. That's the old feeling of unworthy. You were born to feel welcomed and worthy and cherished and empowered. These are your natural birthrights and it's your right to reclaim them. All of them. Yeah. And as you're saying that, I'm taking it in. I'm claiming my space. Right. Yeah. It feels yeah. good. Yes. So tell me the I'm going to put in the chat box. Um, tell me the four so I can write them for people. So okay. they have it. Okay. The, the first one is welcomed with joy. Mm -hmm. Welcomed with joy. Mm -hmm. The second one is worthy and nourished. That's a big one. Worthy and nourished. The third one is cherished and protected. Every woman wants to be cherished and protected. That's a big one too for women. Yes. Cherished and protected. And the last one is uh, empowered with choice. It was a close call before between voice and choice, but it's uh, it's uh, empowered with choice. Well, choice is very empowered, you know. Yes, you have a right to choose and you have a right to say, and you have a right to create a, a, a you know, a relationship where you both get your wins in life. Yeah. Yeah. I'm all for the win-win situation. I'm, um, I'm a proponent of win-win. <laughs> so I know you have a gift for our audience. Uh, can you tell us what it is? And I'll put it in the chat box for everybody. Sure. Uh, I have this, I have a, a, a free video guide with short videos, three to four minutes. I call it Dr. Gary's a guide to lasting love. And the cool thing is you can choose your version of it. There's one version for singles who are afraid of dating and uh, want to get back out there again. There's one for singles who are dating and they're tired of being on the hamster wheel of not finding Mr. and Ms. Right, right? Uh, and the one. And then there's one for couples. So it's Dr. Gary's Guide to Lasting Love. You go to GarySalyer.com, S-A-L-Y-E-R.com forward slash uh, love guide. Mm -hmm. Love guide. And, and it's in the chat box, yeah. Yeah, and you get to choose, so you're empowered with choice. Love the choice. <laughs> we we as women, we're, we love to choose. We have some, we love to choose things. So uh, we have love variety. Uh, so thank you for the interview. We're going to go on thank to uh, Ken D. Foster, and we're going to speak on courage. So unmute yourself, Ken, and then um, I don't know if I can do it. Or, yeah, so introduce yourself and tell us, uh, you know, what you do and what it looks like and how you um, help help us out in the world. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, first of all, I want to thank you for putting this on today. And I want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Gary Saylor. His uh, comments were not only profound, I think they're really moving to those that are stuck in low self-esteem, uh, wondering why life isn't showing up the way that they want. So my background is I'm a, the <clears throat> last 25 years, uh, <clears throat> been a uh, life coach, business strategist. I've written seven books, uh, best-selling author. 
I uh, have my latest book. It's called The Courage to Change Everything, Daily Strategies and Essential Wisdom to Awaken Your Inner Genius. <clears throat> I also have a show that's syndicated in 170 countries. It's called The Voices of Courage Show. If you ask Cortana, Siri, or Alexa to Google Voices of Courage, or just uh, say, play Voices of Courage current podcast, it'll come right up for you. And I'm also a, a TV producer. I've been working on a new show, and that should be out in September, I believe. So got lots of things going on. Also a triathlete. So uh, today I want to talk about courage, and I want to talk about how it impacts us to be able to transcend some of those limitations that are possibly stopping you from maybe having the relationship of your dreams or the business of your dreams or the health or vitality that you have so long for. So that's a little bit about what I want to talk about today. Great. And we're excited to hear it because um, I think many of us out there are, well, and it's interesting because everything's opening up and we're starting to go back into the world. And I think courage is coming up for people. Um, so can you speak about courage? What What do you want us to know about it? Well, I want, I want everybody to know, of course, everybody's born with courage. It's not something you have to go out and find. But it is something that you need to develop. And courage is not uh, running into a burning burning building, although that might take courage, or jumping off of a, a high dive or whatever you think is courage. Courage is actually an energy. It is a frequency. It is a feeling within your own being. And it actually, uh, the Latin word uh, uh, cur, uh, which means courage, which means to speak one's heart. So when you're speaking your heart, you're speaking your truth, you're speaking your passion, you're speaking your power. Again, it's an energy, it's a vibration. I, I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but think about that. Think about uh, the opposite of courage, maybe fear. And fear also is an energy. It's a, uh, you know, we feel it in our bodies. When you're in fear, normally uh, you, you're, you're, shutting down, you're feeling small, your energy's not there, uh, you're in that place of worry and concern, and uh, your energy actually goes down, right? In fact, your influence goes down. So when you're in courage, though, things start to shift again. And I love courage. I, you know, I, it's, it's something that I said everybody has, but a lot of people have undeveloped courage. So what is courage and how do we develop it? Well, one of the things I give my clients is uh, an exercise. I said, you know, if you want to develop courage, this is a great time to do it. <clears throat> so many people are reinvent, have reinvented themselves or are in the process of reinventing either themselves, their business, their relationships, their health. And so if you want to reinvent anything, if you want to change anything, it does take courage. And what is the courage that I believe that it takes? It's the courage to walk into the unknown, into that place where you really don't know how you're going to do this. You don't know how you're going to transcend your self-esteem. You don't know how you're going to have the greatest relationship in your life. You don't know how that business is going to go from zero to a seven-figure business. You just don't know, but you have this insight. You have this idea that this is something that you've been called to do. And that's where the courage comes. So if you'd like to develop courage, one of the ways I encourage you to do it is do something different that you've never done before every single day, every day. This will develop your self-esteem. It will develop your courage. It'll develop you as an individual. And you will start to understand that the unknown or what we think we don't know how to do is pretty much an illusion. I, I wrote a book years ago. It was called Ask and You Will Receive. And at that point, I, I, it, that book had a thousand and one ordinary questions to create extraordinary results. And I want to say in that book, I didn't put one how question in the book. There are always what, why, when, where. 
know how questions. And the reason I didn't do that is because a lot of times for, especially for entrepreneurs, if you go immediately to the how, you go, I don't know. I don't know how to do this. But if you start to use the mind and you start to step into your courage and you say, if I were courageous, what three steps would I take today to walk into the unknown, to manifest that dream? What three steps can I take today, tomorrow, the next day? I would challenge your audience right now, just for the next seven days, ask that question. If I were courageous, think about, think about your dream and then ask, if I were courageous, what are the three steps I would take today? What's going to happen is that you'll have 21 steps that you've taken towards that dream at the end of the week. And you'll probably have walked into the unknown because a lot of times we don't know how things are going to happen. But we know if we just take steps towards it, it'll start to manifest in our life. It seems simple. Try it. Try it out. See if you can do it. I want you to do yes. it. Yes, and I love that because the small steps are the steps that count. And sometimes we think we got it. The big steps are the things that count. And I love this idea as courage being energy because I think it's very difficult to move from the energy of fear. Mm -hmm. So how can we start shift, you know, shifting that energy so that we can like get into the embodiment of that energy and just well well here's where we start all right think about think about your dream now just pick one area one dream that you have maybe it's to have that great relationship maybe it's to have the great business maybe it's to have uh, uh, oh. Oh. a sense of peace of mind in yourself maybe it's to have whatever it is for you Think about that dream. Now, maybe even close your eyes for a moment and go into that dream and imagine that dream three months from now. And imagine that you've moved into the energy of that and it's starting to happen for you. It's three months out. Imagine this dream, whatever that is, it's three months out. Imagine what you'd be telling yourself as you've taken steps towards that dream consistently. Maybe for some of you, that dream has already happened. But if it hasn't, that's okay. Imagine now it's six months out and you've, you've taken consistent steps to this big dream that's been something that you've wanted for a long, long time. Now it's six months out. How would you be talking to yourself? What would you be saying? How would you feel about this? Because you have taken consistent actions towards that dream. Now take it out a year. Now this dream has happened. This is done. You've actually done this. The hardest thing you've ever done, you think. But you know, you look back and you think, wow, it was just steps, daily steps that I took towards this dream. Imagine what you would feel like. Imagine how that would be for you. Now come back six months, three months, and come back to the now and open your eyes. And this is how we can start to visualize and manifest our dreams. Now listen, some of you couldn't visualize it. Okay, I get that. You can do that exercise on your own and just ask yourself, how do I feel? How do I feel about this three months out after I've been doing this? How do I feel about it six months? How do I feel about it? If you will use that exercise on a consistent basis, you'll start to tap into that power that's already within you. You will start to see that dream. You will start to feel it in your body. That's our first step in really manifesting anything. Now, of course, if you are not feeling it and you are not connected to it, then I, I would question that for you. And I would ask you to, uh, to go to your why. Why are, you, why are you doing this? Think about it. And maybe your why is not big enough. That's okay. Ask yourself why it's really important for you to accomplish this dream. You know, why, why it's going to happen no matter what. And if you can't get there, then it's probably not the dream that you need to manifest right now. It may be down the road. But maybe right now you set that on hold and find that dream that's really big for you. You know, we create the future in the moment. Our future is created in the moment. It's not created in the future, right? It's created right now. So today is the day that you can step into your courage and start to manifest those greater dreams and not be stuck. You know, 
one of my gifts is I've been able to help people see the unseeable and know the unknowable and do the impossible. So how do we do that? See the unseeable. Well, I just gave you an exercise to see the unseeable. You can see your future if you want to, if you want to work with it mm -hmm. and know the unknowable. What is that? Well, knowing the unknowable is that wisdom that we tap into on a consistent basis. How do we tap into it? I'll tell you the exercise that I use with myself and my and my clients. At the end of the day, I use a process of introspection into me see, right? Introspecting into me. And I ask three simple questions every day. What worked? What didn't work? And what can I do to improve myself or the or the, whatever I'm working on tomorrow? What worked? What didn't work? And what can I do to improve? If you follow that every day, and you're, you're noticing what worked and didn't work. A lot of times people don't want to go to what didn't work because they're so hard on themselves that they feel like they're going to criticize themselves and get critique. I, I don't want you to do that. I just want you to be dispassionate, noticing what worked, what didn't work, and where you can improve. Imagine if you took steps to improve every day for the next 365 days. Imagine what your life would be like in any area. Imagine if you could stay focused and be able to do that. And imagine if you could every day get astute wisdom. Astute wisdom. What's that wisdom? It's your yeah. inner knowing. It's your inner voice. And I, so we I get wanna... wisdom from the outside and the inside. But imagine if you could do that. That'd be pretty cool. Yes, yeah, so I want to cut in real quick because a couple of things came up. One was that it is a process of building. It's like, it is a building process because I remember when a coach asked me about my vision for my business and I was like, I just want, you know, I don't want too much, right? right? And the fear for me was that if I have this big vision, it means I have to show up. If I say it, it means that people could look at me and maybe if I fail, could judge me. Like all these things come up for people when they when they go big with their vision. Um, and I love that, you know, you say that's normal. I think it's normal until you start practicing it, right? Right. Well, that's a really good point. And mm -hmm. that happens to a lot of my clients. They have this big vision and then the block comes up. Oh, I don't have the time. I don't have the energy. It's going to be too much. I'm going to be an overwhelm. I won't have time to take care of my children, my family. I'll have to stop doing everything I'm doing. Uh, I don't think this really is for me. Well, I have to tell you, you know, whatever your dream is, God didn't give me your dream. You got your dream. And you know somewhere inside of you, you feel that dream. And that dream's there. So how do we get out of our own way? Well, you know, last decade was the decade of expression. We expressed ourselves on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, and we're just expressing everything that's on our mind, right? <laughs> the new decade is called collaboration. Yes. This is the decade we're coming into collaborating with each other, just like we, uh, the four of us are doing here. And uh, we're collaborating to support you to grow your your life, your business, your thought, your expansion. We're up-leveling everybody. So you don't have to do it alone. You really don't. I've started, I'll give you a story. Uh, four years ago, I decided to reinvent myself. And I was asked to be on a radio show in San Diego, KCBQ with, a, uh, uh, with Paula Shaw. And I thought to myself, yeah, that's, that, that, that'd be cool. I've been thinking about being on radio for a while. And I didn't know anything about radio. I mean, literally zero other than listening to radio like so many of you. So when she invited me, I, I was honored to be invited. But then I thought, well, what, how do we make money with this? You know, I'm a business guy. <laughs> and, um, you know, first thing I asked her was, you know, how, how do we make money? She says, well, I don't know. I just pay the station $2,200 a month and they put me on air. And I went, well, I'm not going to be part of that. So I thought, you know, my, my, my thought was, well, let's put a, a plan around that. So I did. All right. And we, we got a sponsor in the show. And we were uh, profitable from the day one that I came in the show. And then I thought, well, I, I don't know anything about radio. 
And I thought, well, who does? And, you know, I found one person that knew a whole bunch about radio. And I asked him, would you meet with me every two weeks? And I'd like to create a group and I'll support you in growing your dream if you can support me in growing my dream on this radio. And we did. And so, and then I added people to the group. We ended up with about six of us, I think it was. And each of us would meet every two weeks. We'd share our ideas, our marketing concepts, uh, our contacts, our resources with each other. And we, and we, my show grew from one station to 18 stations. And then we went into podcast and we grew that. You know, it all just started though with me collaborating with one other person and everybody can do that. So I don't know what your dream is, but whatever it is, maybe it's a dream like Gary was talking about, have a better relationship. Wow. Put Gary on your team. That'd be your first team member, right? Um, put Dave on your team. That'd be your first team member or put uh, Amy on your team. You know, this is where courage comes in though, because now we have to get out of our comfort zone and maybe ask somebody that we never asked before to be on our team to support us. And then we say, well, I don't have any gifts or talents to give them. Of course you do. Take some time, list out 10 of your, your, your strengths or gifts that you can actually contribute to somebody else's life. This is what we're stepping into. This is what's happening in the, this decade. So I want you to be a part of that. Write down all of your, your gifts, talents, and abilities. Write them down. Find somebody else to collaborate with on your big dream. Show them how that, to collaborate because you don't know how, but you'll be one step ahead of them. I just gave you the formula to do it. And this is going to help you to manifest your dreams. I hope you take me up on it. Me too. Me too. I'll tell you why. Because every time I poll the audience before each show, Isolation and loneliness is always number one. People are feeling isolated and lonely. And I feel, I understand that because I used to be a lone wolf too. But when you get, there's a way out and it's almost, um, it's almost at our fingertips. It's, it's because of the digital age and because of all this connection uh, that's at our fingertips at all times. So I really appreciate you speaking into that because a lot of our audience, every, this is my 11th live and it's always isolation and loneliness. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. Uh, lo loneliness is in it. Loneliness is a challenge for so many of us. And, you know, I was just listening to the Beatles song last week, all the lonely people, where do they all come from? And I thought about it and I think, you know, I was lonely at one point in my life and uh, somebody gave me the solution to get out of loneliness. And it was a simple solution. It was very hard. They said, just find another person that's lonely like you and, and go be with them, go hang with them. Just give them what you got, right? Somebody find somebody that needs some support and go help them get out of your head, get out of yourself. For me, that was uh, hard to do at the time because it took mm -hmm. courage to go talk to somebody, maybe a stranger or somebody I just met and say, hey, let's talk, you know, let's let's just talk. Let's just have a conversation and being vulnerable to maybe share a dream that you have with them or share a share a part of yourself that uh, you don't want to talk about. Um, sometimes it's easier to do that with people we don't know, by the way, rather than close family members. Um, you know, you just share that authenticity and it takes courage. And I will say this, I, uh, I wrote this book, it's called The Courage to Change Everything, Daily Strategies and Essential Wisdom to Awaken Your Inner Genius. You can find that book at couragetochange.us. I hope it's okay to say that, Amy, is that okay? Yes, yeah. because it supports my audience. Yeah, courage, audience. courage to change .us, and it's, uh, you know, every day it gives you, it gives you um, wisdom from the East and the West, and cutting edge uh, principles that will help you to get out of your own self and evolve, uh, evolve into that place that you so long to be. And if we all get real, there's something that you want and you want it, you want it to happen in your life. I don't know what it is, but we all have desires. And if you get real with it and go, you know what? It's possible for me to do this. It is possible. But you got to step into your courage and you got to become vulnerable and you got to walk into areas that you don't want to walk into. And eventually, if you do that long enough, though, you will start feeling comfortable 
being uncomfortable. You'll start feeling comfortable walking into unknown places. I'm not talking about dangerous places. I'm talking about they might feel dangerous to us because we've never been there. But I'm talking about stepping into your power, empowering yourself to walk through some of the challenges that are facing you and to up-level your life as a result of that. I, I, tell, I tell you this through experience of working with thousands of individuals now over a period of uh, 25, 26 years. Anybody that's willing to be vulnerable and step into their own power, they transcend. That's how it works here, right? But I also say this, if you're gonna stay stagnant, nobody stays stagnant in this planet. It gets more painful and it gets more miserable. So you can break the cycle today by saying, I'm ready to take the next step, whether it be buying my book or whether it be talking to Gary or talking to Dave or talking to Amy or staying on the summit until it's done. Cause I guarantee if you're here, there's reasons you're here. There are messages of truth, hope, wisdom, and understanding and love that will help transcend your life. Mm, thank you for that. Beautiful. Yeah. I, I'm going to tell you um, my hope for this clean slate after COVID is that we have more connection that when we go on the street, we smile at one another, we say hello, right? And that's big in LA, by the way, we don't usually do that. So I'm, that's like my real big hope. And I, I go out there and live it and I say, hi, hello at the grocery store, look at people in the eye and really see them. I think that is my big hope for our change after this event that all of us have lived through. Uh, that's that's like one of my like, oh, God, wouldn't it be beautiful if we just would walk out our door, go to the grocery store and see people and say hi. Well, you you and me, you and me will uh, get together someday. Maybe we're going to do this on Zoom. We're all going to have a mask burning party. <laughs> yeah. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, someday enough people have been vaccinated. Enough people have got the disease. Mm -hmm. It's herd immunity. And everybody's going to go, mm -hmm. okay, we can let go of this. And I hope that's sooner than later. I know I attended an event, uh, first time I've been out in over a year. It was called the Women's Empowerment Summit put on by Sharon Doyle in Escondido, California over the weekend. And uh, the people there felt comfortable enough to give each other hugs and to connect with one another. So it was, it was a great experience. And I wish that experience on everybody because I know it's coming. And I know that eventually everybody will feel safe enough to come back out and be themselves and connect with one another and realize this is just a temporary state. And if you're, you know, it, this temporary state, we can look at what's wrong. We can look at what's right about it, right? I personally have stayed on what's right about it and yeah. changed up in so many ways. I hope your audience is doing the same because it's, it's a great time to change ourselves, change our businesses and step into that power that we have been that latent power that's within all of us mm -hmm. to take your lives to a new level. Yeah, I'm so there with you, Ken. So I know that you have a gift for our audience. Yes, I and do. You want to speak uh, to that? I'll put it I would top. love to speak to that. I, I have a gift for you that has been developed over 20 years. It's called my release process. And the reason I want to give that to you today is that this is a process when you go through it, it might take you between three to six hours to do it. It's a global release of the subconscious blocks within your own being to help you to acknowledge your guilt, your shame, your remorse, those relationships that didn't work, the hurts, the harms, the pain, whatever's underneath the surface. I'm really good at designing questions to bring that surface uh, stuff up so you can look at it, acknowledge it, and make a conscious choice. You don't have to forget the memory, but you need to let go of the emotion around it. That's really what this is about. So it will help you to release the emotions. And as you do, you'll be like, uh, what do I want to say? Well, for some, it's like taking a dark pair of sunglasses off you never knew you had on. So this is a great experience, a great work that I hope you'll uh, uh, do yourself. Anyway, you can. it's called the release process. You can get it at 
kendfoster.com. Go to the homepage. Just scroll down. It's right there waiting for you. And uh, I hope you'll take me up on it because it'll change your life. Yeah, I'm excited to do it. I It's in the chat box also, everybody. Uh, but yeah, I'm excited to do that because, as I say, I feel such a sense of renewal after this process. And I'm ready to go out and just go out there. And well, you know, it's, it's, a great, <laughs> it's a great, it's a great process. And, you yeah. know, here's, here's what I found. It does have a limitation. So mm -hmm. it'll give you a release and it'll give you a deep release. And you'll probably like, you know, when I first did this uh, process, um, what happened for me is everything got brighter. I mean, literally, um, for about three days, you know, plants look fluorescent to me. But I have to tell you that um, what I found is that if you have chronic issues going on, then you need to go see uh, Dr. Gary Saylor. You need to go see Dave Elliott. You need to see somebody that can help you go dive deep in the chronic issues. But this will give you a really global release of a whole bunch of stuff. So that's cool. But then if you've got things going on and just not moving, you need to find somebody that can really help you understand those subconscious blocks that are under there so that you can release them permanently. Nobody needs to live with pain, with worry, with stress, with concerns, with limitations, with lack, with, with poverty. You don't have to live that way. It's just old imprinted pieces on your mind. And once you release them, you rise to the and things to get better. So I hope you'll take me up on All my right. offer and if oh, you yeah. can't break the pattern yeah so uh goes okay so uh yeah Kai, you i put the uh, link in the chat box so it should be right in there um i put in a couple times can i think you're going you're going in and out for us so what's going to happen next is we are going to, uh, Dave, if you could do a quick, um, you were, yeah. So, so Dave, if you can do a, you know, introduce yourself quickly and then what will happen is we'll go into the round table section and then we'll go into your personalized interview. Sure. Great. So, uh, wow. What a treat to be here so far. <laughs> Thank you to my esteemed uh, gentlemen and colleagues. It's great to be part of uh, the event today. So my name is Dave Elliott, my company, Legendary Love for Life. I work with incredible women all over the globe, helping them get clear and attracting in uh, what exactly they want, especially in the area of love. So uh, really honored to be part of the roundtable here. Hmm. Well, I'm excited to jump in. And if you out there um, have any questions, uh, put them in the chat box so that we can go ahead and um, get those questions answered for you. And um, no problem, Kyle. You, we see you. I see you. <laughs> it's in there. So let let me let me go ahead and um, bring some questions in from the audience so that we can um, we can get those questions answered. Um, all right. So there's a couple of women. This is interesting, and I know that you could maybe speak into courage of this kind of starting something new. Is you know, many a couple of women are out there um, who are dating. At age 65, 85, like we've got these women who are, I'm going to say, probably very um, vivacious and ready. And um, so can you speak into um, how the courage of that? I think it's a beautiful thing being of that age and ready to go out there. Um, but can you help them? What's a good platform for them to go on if you're dating or if you are uh, finding trying to find love in your life? What would you recommend for those women who are, um, you know, well, I'm I'm up there, too. Right. So it's like <laughs> L.A. L.A. age, I'm pretty old. But so for us women over 50, how can we um, go out there and find love again? Who wants to do date? In particular or? Uh, Dave, you go first, because so that we can hear you. And uh... sure, um, well, yeah, I would say kudos to those ladies who are out there uh, 
think it's never too late to go out and find love. And I, I think most people, you know, we're collecting wisdom all along the way. And so what a shame it would be not to access or take advantage of the wisdom that you've gained uh, to be out there and to share. I mean, I really think that, um, you know, you said earlier today, love is kind of your birthright. And I think it's beautiful to go out and claim it and to be, hopefully as you get older, and become more open and more open to love. Love is a, a verb, it's a behavior. So uh, in terms of like, where would be a good place? I mean, I get asked this question about dating sites all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, in that in that age range, I've heard some good things about Our Time, uh, OurTime.com. It's also, it's a lifestyle uh, thing, uh, but there's also other psychographic aspects of, of websites and so for instance if they're there are dating sites but they also focus on there are some that focus on maybe a particular lifestyle choice that you have there's some about fitness singles there are some for spiritual singles there's so my thing is think about who you are and what you bring to the table and what you're looking for that would be a great match for you and and maybe choose one of those psychographic ones it's not just about the age it's about who you are like what what kind of relationship are you looking for you're looking for something active or you look for something travel based um and just do a little bit of research based on things like that so there's yoga type thing um yoga singles sites so again find something that's um a match for who you are personally and then i and i think you'll maybe get closer to the mark and what you're looking for mm, thank you who wants to jump in on this one next you know i want to i get asked how do you find somebody right yeah and i i made this point in my book safe to love again i spent a whole chapter on it you know a lot of dating sites uh, have this algorithm based on preferences, what you like, you know, uh, and it's, I call it the list of characteristics. It's a compatibility list. But the problem is, is that even, you know, uh, like the former president of OKCupid OK pointed out, they know that these algorithms actually don't predict lasting love. That's an initial attractor thing, but when you have done the research, what they find out is that when people use compatibility as a means of selecting somebody, these partners will often say, uh, oh, we didn't make it because we just didn't have enough things in common. When the actual problem was what is called in the research, the quality of the marital friendship, what I would call the four feelings of, of secure love. When you don't use compatibility, then they looked inside and said, so what are we doing inside uh, uh, the relationship? Are we feeling welcome worthy? So the real key is to, to, to take your, you know, your 65 things that you want on your compatibility list, make it three to five, make it three to five. And then what you're looking for in the relationships, how do I feel? Look more to how, what sort of friendship in terms of these feelings are showing up. If you do that, uh, because what these long lists are doing, I don't know, but, you know, you look at it and you go, well, gosh, have I ever done Pilates? I'm not sure if I'm worthy. And they, they're, you know, man, I'm not six foot. I don't have a full head set of hair. You know, I mean, I'm five foot nine. You know, <laughs> what's that going to do? I, I don't hike. I haven't traveled to Barcelona and done the running bowls, you know. Um, uh, but... Uh, this makes a lot of us feel unworthy to start off with. Do we have all that? And so uh, my job is to let everybody know the list doesn't work as well for predicting long-term love. If you want to really find lasting love to attract and keep it, get, <clears throat> get a few key things you really need. Everybody's got a few things. And then, uh, yes, physical attraction is good. And then you, you start tracking those feelings. If you can give them, they're a winner. Thank you for that. I have something that came up in my mind, but on my turn, I will talk about it. Ken, you are up. So tell us courage and how, you know, how to put ourselves out there again and how to really, or whatever you want to speak on. Uh, let me unmute you. Let, let me give there you, you some gotcha. hope. Okay. Let me give you yes. some hope if you're uh, over 50. 
there is 350,000 centurions on the planet today, okay? 350,000 people that are living past 100. So listen, 50, you're, you're like halfway through life with these, you know, and there'll be millions of those people when we reach that age. So you're just, you're really kind of a baby in the woods, uh, honestly, walking into the next uh, part of your uh, your life. Um, I just say this, um, it takes courage to look at our values, right? And I know when I um, when I got here with uh, what I what my non-negotiables were in my life, um, that's when I attracted my wife in, and we've been married 21 years now. But I looked, at, you know, I, I got really clear with what are my values. My my highest values were, uh, well, of course, courage, but loyalty, spirituality. Um, I wanted somebody that uh, was committed to their health, their vitality, um, and the spiritual part. I, I really needed somebody that had spirituality because I knew I'd make a lot of mistakes, and I needed somebody that knew how to forgive and consistently. And so I looked at the top five values, and um, that was most important for me. Like Gary said, there are things that we have that we really have that we really need. And one of the ways I got to that, Barbara DeAngelis uh, gave me an exercise to do way back when she said, Ken, never forget that last relationship that didn't work. And she said, go and make a help, help wanted ad with all the negative qualities uh, that person had. So you never forget those non-negotiables, right? So, you know, my help wanted ad went like something like wanted, uh, incredibly uh, self-centered, uh, uh, I, I probably won't use the words that I use, but incredibly self-centered, must uh, be all about her, must uh, be a taker, must be somebody that uh, uh, doesn't like my children and uh, wants to manipulate and control and and tell me what to do, when to do, and where to do it on a consistent basis, right? So I, that was my, my help wanted ad on the negative side. Then I realized, well, what is it I really want on the other side? So that's what worked for me. I hope maybe that'll work for some of you. Mm, thank you. So yeah, uh, thank you for that, Ken. Um, I think it's important to, I, I might just do that help wanted ad. <laughs> so, but as I'm thinking, I just a couple of things because they, uh, Dr. Gary had said uh, about flipping through and having these, um, you know, looking through the profiles and having these long lists. And what came to mind was like, when I flip on a profile and there's a guy like biking, jumping out of planes, doing all this stuff. I was like, oh no, that's too much work, right? <laughs> Way too much. Oh no, no, no. I, no, I like a nice lounge chair and a margarita on the beach. So uh, I think it's important to like look at the lifestyle of the per person that you're kind of interested in might be a match. But I want to speak it to Wendy because, uh, Wendy, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm hearing you. You know, I also lost my fiance. He passed away um, 2011. So, um, yeah, um, that traumatic experience and having those uh, beautiful years with him and how to move on from that has been a journey for me the last 10 years. Um, so, and I, I know I could speak into and probably feel your desire for uh, new love and new opportunities and new, um, and a life shared with someone. So I want to say that um, I hear you and I, I understand where you're coming from and I haven't met my new love yet after 10 years, but, you know, I'm, I came to a point of uh, really um, releasing um, expectations about what I'm supposed to do and not do and really get into uh, the adventure of meeting new people, whether it worked out or not, didn't matter, but just opening myself up slowly uh, to really receiving the love that I truly want to feel again and have that connection with. So, yeah, I hear you. And, and I would recommend, this is what I recommend is that um, once uh, I don't know where you are living, if everything's open, what I did before COVID was I started. Um, so like I joined a uh, Toastmasters, I joined groups and meetups where I wanted to be around like-minded people. Um, so I would recommend that. I think for any woman out there, you really, the dating apps, I don't know if they're, um, some people probably have success, but I think the more, 
the more success, success is really in being around like-minded people. Like you have the same values like Ken was talking about. Um, you have the same interests. Um, conversations happen easily. So that would be my recommendation. Um, for someone who's lost someone, um, just know that things do change and that there is hope out there and it does get fun and exciting again. <laughs> so I just kind of wanted to speak into that because um, when do you put that uh, very important um, point in the chat box? Uh, Amy, would it be okay for me to make a- Yes, video? yes, get in there, yes. <clears throat> you know, one of the things I talk about in my book is whenever love goes away <clears throat> through a divorce, and especially if there's been anything like being a widow or widower, I call it the paradise lost pattern. And <clears throat> when you've had something really, really good, and then it goes away tragically, it's like you've been kicked out of the Garden of Eden. And a part can say, you know, remember the last time I fell in love? When And you start looking for when does love go away? And then some part says, maybe I won't connect because I'm trying to protect myself from that feeling. It's it, and it can be a subtle thing of the brain gets more safe feeling separate <clears throat> than actual belonging. This part of the brain wants it. This part that says, hi, you know, I'm Ken or Dave or Amy, right? But another part is saying, boy, I don't want to go through that again. And so it protects us in various ways. So, you know, it's, you know, you, you have a right to have paradise regained, <laughs> uh, Wendy. You have a right that, you know, yes, love one way doesn't mean it will in the future. Um, and it's okay to start dreaming again and to know that you have, the, the, you can feel empowered, you know, and for all of you that's out there following up on something that, that Ken said is when you're thinking about going out there and finding that one, just make a quick list of the, the one of the things I help my clients do is what are you willing to take? What are you not willing to take? What are you willing to receive, uh, give and not give? Well, I'm willing to take feedback, but not soul withering criticism. I'm willing to give support, but not sugar daddy or sugar mama. Those are from actual clients. So just know that, you know, go, you know, just you got to really work on that right to feel cherished and protected again. You know, that you have that right. If just because it went away doesn't mean you can't have it again. And then just get clear on, on the new you that's out there after this relationship. What do you want this time around for love 2.0? And just know yes. you're entitled to love 2.0, 3.0, whatever it is. Are we in 3.0 or just 2.0? <laughs> well, it's, you know, for me, <laughs> I've been, been divorced twice, it's 3.0. <laughs> uh, Dave, you, anyone want to chime in to, to Wendy and like her experience and any kind of words of uh, support or wisdom? Uh, let me unmute you, uh, Dave. There we go. Yeah, I mean, I, I could add to that, Wendy. I'm I'm really sorry for your losses as well. I I love that you're here today. I I love that you're here, uh, in in giving yourself the opportunity to maybe see a better future and and foresee yourself stepping into it and maybe accessing that again. And you know, Ken spoke really eloquently about the courage, mm -hmm. uh, the courage to continue, the courage to move forward, and you know. It's maybe the one experience in life is that, you know, that love doesn't end, love continues. And maybe that looks different than what we expected it to look like. But I think if we, if we make that, if we, if we take on that belief, love never dies, love only continues. Uh, and then we can apply ourselves to go in and make that the truth. I think that that's a really powerful way. It sort of puts you on a, a bit of an autopilot. Um, I mean, there's there's a period of grieving. There's a time to, to take some time to care for you. But I I also believe that uh, love is our birthright. Love is here. Love is there for us. Uh, and if you just have that fundamental belief, I think you you can absolutely create it again. Mm -hmm. And I. I just um, offer up compassion, take all the time that, that you need to be good to yourself, but 
to consider that. And uh, I, I wish that for you, if that's what you want. Thank you, Dave. Ken, you want to add anything or? Are we... Well, I, 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 my transmission kind of broke up when uh, when you were sharing. But uh, I think uh, is it her name? Is it Victoria? Is that her name? Uh, Wendy. Wendy. Okay, shared. I, but I took it. She lost her fiance. Oh, I lost my fiance. She lost her husband. She just lost her husband. Okay. I don't. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I I know that for me sometimes we can't make sense out of out of loss it just it it comes and we we try to make sense out of it we try to wonder why why this happened and and you know especially when we you know we we think about the future that we wanted to gather or wanted to have um and the future's not there and we we get we're sad because that future is not not there and so my heart goes out to you and Wendy, and, and I know that um, it does take courage to, to move past these difficult times in our life. But I think uh, I always fall back on a saying that somebody told me once, and they said, you know, God never gave you more than you can handle. And at the time of loss, you just want to scream and Maybe, you know, get get upset with God. God with, I've done many times. <laughs> Wait till I'm on the other side. I'll be, yeah. Oops. Oh, okay. Well, you were breaking up, Ken, but, oh my gosh. So yes, Wendy, um, I'm here to tell you, you're not failing, okay? <laughs> it's not, you know. Sorry, sorry about that. That's a, yeah, I know, we're sorry, yeah. mister. I know. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. I just wanna tell you, Wendy, we see you. Uh, uh, yeah. I don't, yeah, I don't think any of us on this panel believe in failing uh, and, uh, and uh, that, that, you know, why things are not working out for you is not the place to really go. It's more like, you know, how can you empower yourself to really, to really be and be, be all who you are in, in a loving, empowered way, because nothing grows from fear yeah. and judgment, nothing. So. Wendy, uh -huh. uh, Amy, I, can I share a powerful story real quick about this that I might be right? Uh, so, okay. We're, we're up against the time, so because um, I know Dave has his interview. Okay. I'm sorry. Do you want to? Um... Okay. Share it, and then we'll move on. Yeah, I will. <laughs> I will. Share it, and we'll go. I, I, yeah. I have taken this story with me from, for the rest of my life. I was 20, and at that point, Dr. Sire was just a, a happy-go-lucky jock, and I was visiting... Uh, a friend, they were 35, um, and uh, his wife was dying. She was about 37. They had three small children. She was in a coma, and they the doctors were saying she'd be dead by the weekend. She would be passing away. And we were at the foot of the bed talking to this 35-year-old man who's saying, how do I raise a three and a five and a seven-year-old on my own without this woman that has loved me? And she, he, he said to us under his breath, I will never love again. And about 10 minutes later, we hear a voice from the other end of the bed. And his wife had come out of the coma and says, George Michael Smith, if after all the love I have given to you, you cannot find it in your soul to be loved again and to give it to another deserving woman, then I have failed you as my wife. Promise me you will give it to another woman, the love that we shared, that you will pass it on to somebody else. And I just remember being in, in tears. And if you had that great of a love with a husband, I am sure on the other side that they want you to be loved, to find that same love again. Um, that woman came out of a grave 
and was dead by the next day. But I think that all of those who have had someone pass away, they're doing nothing. You know, your beloved wants you to feel loved again. Um, mm -hmm. and yes. And, uh, yeah. And I believe my beloved is right next to me, having a good time with me and yes. enjoying the process and being, I believe that totally. Yeah. So now we're going to go with Dave. We're switching to Dave because Dave has his interview right now. So Dave, will you, uh, you interest introduce yourself earlier. Will you briefly introduce yourself again and tell us, you know, who you serve, who your clients are and what you're, what you're seeing out there in the world today and how you're helping um, people find love. First of all, Gary, thank you for sharing that story. Yeah. Uh, that, that got me. That gave me the yeah, goosebumps. The goosebumps. Well, that, that was pretty good. Thank you. Um, so again, Dave Elliott, Legendary Love for Life. I work with amazing women all over the globe, helping them to attract and keep the love that they truly deserve. And so I absolutely love it. So I love that there's so many people here uh, who were called to come to this event when I first heard about it and I was invited to be a part of it as well. I just, I just loved, you know, what it said about, you know, moving toward the unstoppable you, having the courage to continue figuring out who you are, what is it that you want, what do you want more of, and how do you go and create it? And I, and I love, um, you know, the people that came today, you know, you, you had mentioned earlier on, we were talking about, you know, isolation and, you know, maybe not, not necessarily having the courage to continue. I love the fact that those, those folks would be, could be anywhere else doing anything else today but they chose to come here. They were attracted to this event. They were they were looking to find a way. They're looking for a, a, a nugget, some kind of a, a piece of advice. Maybe it's a story that Gary just shared that was mm -hmm. kind of reached out and kind of grabbed them. So I just celebrate the fact that they're here and they're pondering what is it to be unstoppable. And, and I'm just honored to be here and be a part of it and maybe provide some of those nuggets as well. Mm -hmm. So what type of work do you like? Who comes to you? What 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 are uh, women seeking when they come to you? And tell us about that. Tell us so pe people can say, oh, that might be me. Well, I would say that the women that I work with are incredible achievers in every other area of their lives. They're phenomenal in, in business. They're often divorced, uh, single, uh, sometimes never married. Uh, they're very... A lot of times they're parents, they're excellent parents. They're, they're really just incredible women in every other aspect of life. I think the one thing that gets in the way is they don't understand men very well. And so what I kind of do is take a, like a, an education sort of approach to it. I, I, I love to, I, I talk about what I do is I, I teach women to bring out the very best in men so they don't suffer from the worst. I, th I think a lot of times there are unresolved wounds from the past. Um, experience experiences that have happened have created you know certain let's call it um ineffective beliefs that sort of uh get in the way of having what it is we want in relationships so maybe they'll take on beliefs that you know maybe men have not been incredibly honest in the past maybe they have cheated so these are all wounds that people take on and and really my hope today is to talk about discovering some of these unresolved wounds from the past uh what i call this these secret saboteurs and help people understand um that those are not happening to torture you they're they're happening to teach you and so that you can move toward a more loving um and healed version of yourself and so those are the clients that i work with and have great success with yeah, so let's jump in there. Let's solve some secret saboteurs. Tell us about that. Uh, sure. So, it, you know, a lot of times um, we talk about our our our, our past past lives, things that have occurred for us in the past. And so, I wrote a book. Um, you've ever heard the the saying, you know. Uh, same stuff, different day. It's not, they don't use the word stuff, but it's a, a same stuff, different day. Well, I wrote a book called, called Same Shit, Different Date. And so I took that whole thing where I, I put it into the dating pool. And so I asked the question, you know, it's not, it's not a coincidence. It's not happenstance. It's not dumb, blind luck that you keep attracting the same types of partners. You know, the, the one unique, uh, thing that all the people that you date in common had the same issues as you. 
And so when you start to understand and like, why am I attracting the same types of people and the same types of issues? And, and I never actually saw that this is like this. What I help people do is do that deep dive and figure out what did those last men that you dated uh, have in common? Why do you keep attracting this? What is it? What unfinished business is there that is trying to come to your awareness, trying to come to your attention? And so my belief, that's why I wrote the book. I want to bring it to your attention. And then once it becomes, it, it gets on your radar, you start to, you can start to look at it from a healthier way. You look at it that it's not there to torture you. It's there to teach you. Uh, so, you know, I talk about in the book, the fact that, you know, we get, we get wounded in our relationships from the, the things that happened in the past, but then we get triggered. And then we also ultimately get healed. And it's a three-part process. Most people stay stuck in stage two where they're still in the triggering process. Once they figure out what it is, how it's triggering them and what they need to learn to have it in differently, well, then they can circumvent the entire system. And then that's when they get towards healed. And so that's what I like to do. I, uh, rather than keep people struggling and stuck uh, with these secret saboteurs, I help them see what's hiding in plain sight. And once you see it, you can heal it. Yeah, and I want to tap into something you said a little bit earlier, which it took me a while to learn. It wasn't until, um, you know, I had like a semi stepchildren living in my house that were boys. Cause I grew up with all girls. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had no understanding of men. Like, like <laughs> how would I know what a man is, does and not do? Cause then we get so frustrated because of their, they're just being their usual. I don't know. They just have a way of being that's different than women. So it took me a long time to recognize, you know, I have no education of men because I grew up with all women. So what are like three things you could tell me about men that maybe I don't know? Cause I've, I've just didn't grow up. Or, I mean, I had my dad, but he was absent, but like didn't really grow up with men. Like, can you tell us some like things that might make our life easier? <laughs> and understanding them. Thank you for sharing that. I, I heard you say kind of in passing that you didn't grow up with your dad. So like that so would be was, one of your. Yeah. So he's in the house, but he didn't talk to us. It's a whole thing. It's like, but uh, you know, he didn't really. Silent yeah, Got he's it. Strong. <laughs> Got it. Um, well, I would say maybe one of the number one things that I think sometimes blow blows women away. They have no concept of it is that you, you would probably be shocked how, how much a man would do to actually want to please you if he could. I think where things get kind of twisted is you will actually, you, you'll actually see the worst of a man's behavior when he feels like he can't please you. Um, and, and when you, when you start to understand them that they're not, they're not broken units behaving badly, you know, I, I think you, you bring up a good point. We make certain assumptions based on our own experiences and, you know, beliefs and uh, references and preferences in this world, right? If you believe, you believe everyone, we make this the fundamental fallacy assumption. Everyone's wired like me. Everyone wants the same things. Well, that's, that's just absolutely not true. You know, masculine energy is very different. It navigates the world. It's kind of single focused, um, outcome driven. It's logical. It's analytical. The, it seems the downside of that might seem like, you know, because men are not as in touch with their emotions, that might seem like a downside, like he's, you know, I just absent, he doesn't get me, he doesn't connect with me. The benefit to him though, is like he absolutely can be there and he could be a rock and, you know, like a, like a really um, painful, emotionally cathartic situation. He could be a rock, he could just put his arm around, he said, baby, I know, I'm sorry. And in those words, and, and he's, He's just the rock in that moment. You know, that's a benefit, you know, but but too often we we judge and we tell ourselves stories like, oh, he's just, you know, he's not even there. Um, but there's there's a a beautiful reciprocity about understanding how masculine energy and feminine energy, one is no better, uh, but they're really just beautiful and they're they're supportive with one another when we stop making them wrong, when we can get beyond these these old beliefs these old wounds about 
you know, what we believe about them and what's wrong with them and how they're different or how they're, they're, they're strange. You know, I, I just, I went to, um, early on in my career, I've been doing this now for like I guess 14 years this year. Um, and, and I just sort of blurted this out one time. I talked about, you know, masculine energy and feminine energy. It's kind of like a, think of a coloring book, a coloring book, you get a brand new coloring book and the, the black outline, the line drawing, it's essentially, that's the masculine experience. It's, it's simple, it's flat, it's no frills. There's no depth, there's no tonality, there's no texture. It's just boring. Uh, but it's clear, you know exactly what it is. It stands on its own. That's a masculine experience. But what makes it a work of art is when you put the fl flash of color, the splashes of color, all the colors of the rainbow, the beauty, the, the bright brights and the, the dark darks. And sometimes it's the coloring outside the lines that can be almost be nonsensical, but it's all the emotion. And when you put it together, uh, it's really kind of a work of art, but it, you know, it, left to its own devices, um, the just the the outline is kind of boring and and flat uh and left the feminine experience of all of emotion it can be sort of unfocused and um i guess um, a little bit all over the place uh, you know it kind of brings it together so yeah i think that's a great way of understanding the the beauty of both yes and uh, uh and it was such an education and, and since that time in my life where I had like three men and me in one house, I was like, okay, this is nothing personal. <laughs> like I was like, okay, it's not personal. It's just who they are. Right. Uh -huh. And they, they have a vested interest in not making it personal because they, yeah. they actually want peace most of the time. Again, that's the, the you know, the peace, Lack of peace would come from strong emotions, typically. Like, because again, if a man's in logic, he's like, well, logically, it doesn't make sense to get in an argument here. So he will avoid that. Um, and so, so anyway, it's just understanding that people bring certain um, great aspects to themselves. And when we, I think we can cease to make other people wrong. I, I think we can find a lot, lot more ways to find satisfaction um and an appreciation for both you know i give the example too like you know my my natural core is masculine i'm a problem solver i want to fix things i want to get a result for people right but when i'm coaching what i'm doing is i am i'm listening with empathy i'm listening with kindness i'm opening people up i'm making them feel safe to tell me their you know their darkest ser secrets or their their biggest wounds or insecurities. So what I'm doing is I'm using fem the feminine emotion to create this safe space so that I can serve people. So like, you know, we all have both energies and we can jump back and forth. It's kind of like the right tool for the right job. You know, if you only have a hammer, the whole world looks like a nail. So I think when we start to understand that there is beauty in both toolboxes, uh, there's a time to go with emotion, there's a time to go with logic and analysis. Um, and sometimes to blend them beautifully. You know, I think that's where you, we get all the, the benefits of, of everything at our disposal. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to speak into uh, the woman who's in a lot of um, misunderstanding and pain because they're looking at their uh, partner who, you know, in this point would be a male partner. There's other mm -hmm. partnerships, but in this particular um, area. So what we, what would you recommend for that woman who is standing there in that position of, you know, he just gets mad at me. I can't talk to him. He's not listening. Like, what would you um, recommend for her to start doing like little steps, like, you know, help them. Do you have a little bit more of information about what it's about? He's mad. Do you know? Well, because we are, or... yeah, so it's more like because we're not understanding the masculine energy and right. we as women want them to act like our friends on some like be chatty like our girlfriends and our feminine energy. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of women in that position where, uh, I mean, you can't solve their particular problem because we don't know what it is, but it's more like how can they shift and start recognizing that, you know, really loving his powerful masculine energy and you know what we do is we want our men, I'm just going to say it. We want our men to be like us. Right. That's what we want. And it causes a lot of conflict. 
that's just what how it is. And so, and for us, it's very difficult to step away from that because we're embroiled into we're embroiled into our our own pain and 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 the struggle. Well, I, I mean, I think in your in your question, you mentioned that he's angry. So if a man is angry, it means he is. What I said to you earlier, one of my first um, the presupposition is you'd be shocked what a man would do to please you if he believes he can. Right. And right about the time that he feels like he cannot, it's a lost cause. He will shut down. He will get angry. He will stop caring. He will, it will look like, you know, he's checked out. The, the beautiful thing about the feminine and the nurturer is that a little attention, a little respect with, with masculine energy, respect and appreciation goes a long way. So even if he's upset about something, if you, if you come back and readdress it again, I'm not sure what exactly it is, but if you just, if you make an attempt to understand the problem from his perspective, what is, why is he angry? What's he feeling? What's he focusing on? What would he like to have instead? If you just ask that question from a, like, look, I'd really like to work this out. Talk to me about how we can make this a win-win. Again, there's that's men love to solve problems and fix things. So you actually you you turn him back on and he gets interested, like, oh, oh, fix I get to fix something? Yeah. Okay, here's what I need for that to happen. I want this, this, and this. How do we do that? And then you start to game plan and you start to come up with, well, what works for you? What works for you? I can I'm willing to do this if you do that. And and so I, I think you can reawaken that unless, you know. It's just so far gone. Uh, but again, I think that's the, the power of feminine is uh, just opening that up and, and giving him the possibility to believe that maybe you can make it better. If you can, he'll, he'll love it. Um, mm -hmm. We really are wired to do it. Yeah, so one of the audience members, which uh, they pre-submitted a question like, you know, how to... Uh, manage her own communication style to effectively communicate with her husband. Mm. Like, uh, because I think it's our responsibility to, as women, to also um, know that the communication that we communicate, the way we communicate, doesn't always land with our partners. And how can we uh, kind of adjust that uh, communication so that we feel good, and but it doesn't get too confusing, too. I don't know if it's confusing for the man or not. You can tell me. No, well, the thing is, if you, you know, every now and again, you can, you can kind of, um, <laughs> like, there's, a, like, occasionally, mm -hmm. I think one of the, the, the challenges between masculine and feminine is, like, occasionally the feminine will want to emote and share because that's a process of the feminine uh welcoming a man into an experience and helping her to feel understood and connected at a deeper level and because i mentioned that whole thing about we like to fix stuff um it's really hard for us to just listen to understand and not listen to fix listen to solve and so occasionally if she throws him a little bone like hey you know what I ran into a problem today and I'm not really sure what to do about this situation. Can I tell you about it and see if you have any ideas? And he will just think it's the greatest thing in the world because you're actually asking him to solve a problem for you and he'll, he gets to, you know, puff his chest and feel like he, he contributed something of value. Now, again, where, where that goes off track is where like you're just list you're, communicating to connect but he's trying to solve the problem and you you think he's you think he thinks you're broken and you can't come up with your own solution and that's where people get misunderstood mm -hmm. so you know again it, it it depends on it's about understanding about how people are wired and what makes them feel best men do love to solve problems but they can also listen to connect too um if you just incentivize them for doing it um and just you know a couple of things you know, masculine will probably, you know, in a typical day, masculine masculine being is going to have fewer words as a rule, as a generality, not all the time, than a feminine being. Um, so I would say if you're trying to get to communicate effectively, fewer words, probably better uh, as a generality, but not, you know, not all the time. It depends on what the, what the issue is, what you want to talk about, what you want to 
connect on and, and come to an agreement about. So those are just a couple of things to consider in, you know, in order to, to influence someone, you have to know what they're already influenced by. And so, mm -hmm. you know, fewer words, outcome driven, solving the problem, getting to a solution, not wasting energy. That's another thing about the masculine. Like sometimes we get frustrated. Um, sometimes the ladies will get frustrated that, you know, he's, he's shutting down and he won't try something but again he's not going to if it's a waste of energy in his estimation mm -hmm. so again it's it's not feeling like they, he's stonewalling necessarily but he just won't move forward if he feels like well what's the point anyway so things like that yeah and i think you hit something in there it's like uh you know i think if i may speak for many women is that um you do <laughs> We have a hard time just accepting the person in front of us for who they are and finding those beautiful things about them. It's very interesting how we just want, we always wish for something else, wish he would do this. If only he would do that. This is what a lot of women, this is our vocabulary. So can you speak into that a little bit? Because our many of us are in a constant agitation of discontent with our partner. Well, you know, I mean, that's a good point right there. That's a recipe for frustration for both parties because, I mean, it's really kind of a an offensive and unfair act to be looking at someone in the totality of their personhood and say, you know what? I got ideas for you. I want to fix you. You're not doing it right. Um, boy, that's really disrespectful. And again, that's masculine energy, one of the... Uh, just absolute rock bottom things that we need. We need to feel respected. A masculine can't stay in a relationship where he feels disrespected. In fact, he will act out in, in ways you don't want to know if he feels disrespected. Uh, in fact, it's probably just better to end it, you know, but I think if you really want to create, you know, what I call a legendary love for life, yes. I, I think what you're talking about is two people who just look at one another and see the greatness in one another. What do you love about that person? What do you respect about them? What do you acknowledge? What do you notice? What's awesome about them? And, and, and focus on that. I think that's a, that's a beautiful way to keep you know, a relationship growing, you know, like we're, we're going to do some things differently. We have different, you know, needs, uh, hierarchies of needs. We have different preferences and references. We have different experiences. We have different wounds. Some of them healed, some of them unhealed. Um, but when we focus on differences, all we get is more differences. When we focus on greatness, you get more greatness. So like, that's the thing that I suggest is don't, don't focus on what somebody's doing wrong. You know, ask them for what you want. Like I said, a, a man is already presupposed to want to be able to please you. So if you, if you say to him, like, you know, um, hey, look, I had this thing happen today at work. I'm kind of upset about it. I, I just need to get it off my chest and I want to share it. I'm not looking for a solution. I'm not looking for you to fix it. But can you just give me five minutes and let me tell you about this so I can get it off, off my chest and just be done with it for today? And it'll be like, is this, is this a test? Is this a that's all I need to do. I just need to listen to you for five minutes, five minutes. Listen, I don't have to solve it. I don't have to fix it. And you'll be in a great mood the rest of the night. And I'll have helped you just by listening. That's, there's no catch. That's all I need to do. And he will do it. And he'll do it probably really beautifully because you set him up to win. You asked for what, and you, you were, you know, you were proactive in asking for what you wanted and you turned him into a hero. That's the other thing too. I'll say is like a, women that really have no idea that men really are driven to want to be the hero. And if they can be the hero, they will do remarkable, unbelievable things. And as soon as they don't believe it's possible to be a hero, they'll, they'll do kind of horrific, awful things too. So yes. up to you. Yes. Yeah, so I want everyone to uh, encourage you to um, watch the replay and write those exact words down <laughs> that Dave said that for your next time with your interaction with your partner, you say those words so that everyone can have a win-win situation and a loving relationship. Cause yeah, I, I've been, I've been, um, you know, back in the day that was, you know, we're always in discontent. I was used to be always in discontent in my relationships. Um, uh, so it's not a fun place to be or a happy place. Or, oh, you can't win there. Not you for either win. party. No. <laughs> Um, and since learning, um, learning 
the beauty of myself and the beauty of men and, you know, and the beauty of just respecting and loving the person in front of you is like, it's a game changer. It's a really, and I do agree to, you know, I, I, and I, I'm just going to say that, that we are guilty. Women are often guilty of that, like really trying to change the person that's in front of us, whether it's our partner, our friend, our mom, whoever it is, our kid, like that's, that's for us to really, I think, uh, look to ourselves and to really uh, fix, how, not fix, but like really dive into like what's really driving this. Um, <clears throat> so thank you for that. I'm, I'm going to go back on the replay and write those exact words too. I think, I, you know, that was really, I really appreciate that, Dave. Thank you. I'm glad. Um, so with that, can we, I know you have a gift for our audience. Yes. So can I you mentioned speak that. Yes, absolutely. I mentioned the book that I wrote about, you know, same stuff, different date. Uh, and I've got a preview, free preview version of that. So people can just download it, get a, get a look at it, see if they like it, want to know more about it. And uh, also as part of that, uh, that book series, that was sort of the, um, it launched this, the podcast that I mentioned earlier on in, in, in the story where my introduction, uh, my, the podcast that I do is called Why Haven't I Found Love Yet? And so basically I'm interviewing all these people that I do not know, uh, non-clients, and I'm just asking them questions and I'm helping them track down and figure out what is, what is the, the secret saboteur that's hiding in plain sight that's showing up again and again that people need to heal in order to have the love that they so richly deserve. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm looking for, if I could just say real quickly, if, if there's anyone who is interested in, in being interviewed for that, I'm looking for people to interview all the time. Because again, I want non-clients. So uh, if we can maybe put up a link, if someone would like to volunteer, uh, it's a audio only, uh, people don't, you know, uh, it's, I'm just looking for the stories um, and I'd love to help people. So if anyone would love to do a free session and figure out, oh my gosh, why am I getting stuck? Uh, I would love to offer that to any of the ladies who are listening today. Yeah, thank you. I know Maddie did it, I guess. Uh, Maddie Paxton, Maddie did your interview, I think. Yes. For your podcast. Uh, she's here with us. So you awesome. can uh, go to uh, the, the downloadable will go to Dave's website and then you can contact him through that because uh, I don't have the link for your um for your contact but so i'm you guys this was awesome what i would like to do to close this section off is can you give us like a one takeaway uh that we can um an insight and, and thought a poem something that inspires us to really um uh, keep on our journey of love on courage on um and just keep bringing ourselves forth uh, into this world. Can who wants to give us a takeaway that we can chew on? I, you know, I'll, I'll throw something out there. Um, okay. You know, again, I went back to you know the title, "Unstoppable." What is it that you know? In order to figure out what makes us unstoppable, we have to figure out well, what is it that stops us? So it's limiting beliefs, it's fears, it's insecurities, it's doubt. One of the ways that I overcompensate for that, and I get people set up and you know, what I love about what I do is I teach people that rather than struggling and clawing to get to an outcome, I figure I get really, really crystal clear on what it is so that you get pulled to it rather than struggling to meet it. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways I do that is to figure out like, um, I, do, I give an exercise to clients where I call the magic of 100. I, and especially in the area of relationships, I talk about, well, what are 100 great things that you bring to the table for a partner that they will absolutely love about you? And there's something mm -hmm. magical and special about seeing that third digit, that 100 things we you start to take on and you own the fact that I'm loving, I'm kind, I'm funny, I'm playful, I'm sweet, I'm fair, I'm, you know, and just start to, to riff on these things and you get really empowered. That's the kind of thing that changes the action that you take and it, it, keeps you going in those times where you might feel a little bit stoppable. So again, there's this beauty in, in clarity and conviction and commitment of taking the right action for the right cause at the right time uh, when you have a really, really clear outcome and what it is that drives you. So that would be my tip. Mm, thank you for that. Inside out. Here we go. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. 
Uh, who wants to jump in? Gary? Okay, Dr. Gary? You know, my favorite quote that I've kind of lived with is, there are no unresourceful people, only unresourceful states. And what that means is if, if, if there's no unlovable people, just people that feel, a state that feels what? There's no uncourageous people, just states that feel like fear. So just remember that you not only deserve love, but the power to reclaim that love is within you. If you feel anything less, it's a state, it's not you. There are no, you have the power within you to change your, your destiny with love. So there are no unresourceful people, no unlovable people, just unresourceful, unlovable states. Or, mm. yes. Thank you for that, Dr. Kerry. Ken, what's your big takeaway? Oh, hopefully Lauren. Oh, hold on a minute, let me unmute you. I think you have to unmute yourself. Yeah. All right. I'm unmuted. So my takeaway is this. Go out and have some fun. Go dance. Go sing. Go journal. Go play in the sunshine. Go to the beach. Go to the mountains. Just, just have some fun. Connect with yourself. Feel good about yourself. And then go ahead and write that, uh, write that help wanted ad, the reverse of what you don't want. Get clear with what it is you want. Once you do that, you know, allow yourself to open up to receive the amazing relationship that you really deserve and is really waiting for you at this moment. All right. Thank you for that. And thank you, gentlemen, for this time together. I really appreciate you. Um, I love all of your uh, perspectives and your insights. And as I say, this was a vision behind the Unstoppable You is to bring you know, people who have great insights, great uh, expertise into the living rooms of our audience. And I appreciate you. And I thank you. And um, go have a beautiful rest of your day. I know we're all in, a, well, we're in Pacific time, Gary, but yes, and much love to you guys. Um, all right. There's lots of stuff in the chat, but thank you very much and have a beautiful day. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Dr. Gary. I think Ken, we lost him. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. Thank You're you. You're welcome. Dear. All right. Bye bye. All right. So, woo, that was awesome. Um, let me go in here. So, what did you guys think? Maddie, Kate. Oh my gosh, Victoria. Beautiful, right? Great male, great energy. Um, so I'm going to take a moment before we start our second segment. Woo. So I'm happy that you're here. And I think um, I know, I know that, um, I know that uh, you guys out there got a lot of information and uh, you got a lot of insight and there was a lot of feeling. And, you know, every time I do this uh, live stream, I I poll you guys. I ask for you guys to fill out a survey, you know, so that um, we could speak into what you're going through right now and speak into the questions you have. And and I I think that's so important for every show, because when I design when I decided to do these lives, um, my intention was um you guys, the focus was like, how can we bring a community of people who are in lockdown? Um, how can, you know, I create something that's like really um, fosters hope, fosters possibilities, you know, really fosters this idea that you're not alone and there's no right or wrong. Everybody's got their own process. And if you know me, you know I'm. I do a lot of things unconventional and um, I don't believe in the cookie cutter um, way of healing. Um, and many of you filled out the survey and um, you know, what was fascinating uh, about that was many of you said that you struggled with um, isolation and loneliness, which we spoke about earlier. And also follow through right um, in your life and your work. And in the work that I do, what I notice is what really is happening is that um, 
And we might be reluctant to say this, right? We might be reluctant to say that we're actually afraid to come out from hiding and show ourselves and show our greatness and show who we truly are. And I'm wondering if this resonates with any of you out there in the audience. And if so, you can put yes, yes, yes. <laughs> you know, because it's interesting because we as little girls, um, we would come out, you know, we would come up at little girls like full on, bright, loud, um, just so beautiful and so open. And then someone would say, ah, you're too loud. You're being rude. Be quiet. Don't do that. And yes, 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 Terry. And it's like, so we, of course, feel afraid to come out and show ourselves because of that judgment. And it could have came from anyone, our friends, our teachers, um, our parents, our grandparents. It could come from anyone, a stranger, a stranger, right? It doesn't have to be this way or that way. It's just that, man, we would come out, we would feel good about who we are, and boom, someone would shut us down. So, you know, we began hiding. We began hesitating. We we stopped, like, using our voice. We we stopped being truly like who we are. And I remember at a point in my life when I was almost a different person to everyone I met. Like I could not hold my own voice, my own ideas. I shifted from who was in front of me. And in my relationships, you know, I didn't ask for what I wanted. And yes, Carmela, yes, um, trying to make my partner, the one to change, uh, was a big one for me. And I just want to say that I see you and I know you and I feel um, every live that I do, I feel that's like what women are really wanting in their life is to really come out and shine. And how many of you feel that deep in your soul that you are ready for so much more? that you're ready to stop hiding. You are ready to claim your space. And you know, finally, finally come out of hiding and, and actually play. I mean, it's really a playground out here when you are truly walking in your authentic, powerful self. So are you ready? I mean, is this your time right now? So how many of you out there would like some personalized support on this to identify to what's actually holding you back? What's really keeping you from follow through, keeping you isolated and lonely? What's really keeping you there? What's keeping you from your, that loving relationship, from starting that business? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up my calendar um, during this live, the next three days. And I think I put on Saturday also for those work for working, the ones who are working and book a time with me and let's talk. Because really, I know that I could support you in, in being seen, in getting the love that you truly desire and want. And you don't have to freaking gusto to like create a beautiful life where you don't have to hide. You can be who you are, like truly who you are. You know that essence of who you are? It's there for you. It's possible for you. I know it's there for you because I was the same way. I, I was the same way in feeling like I had to hide who I was shut down, be quiet, just be the observer, don't enter into life. So the link is there for you. 
uh, over the next four days today uh, it, through Saturday, it is there for you to, you know, connect with me and start moving towards the change that you really, really desire. And with that, what I'm going to do is introduce the next panel of guests. And I'm going to add Andy and Dan Harrison. And Dave got back in here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> We're going more Dave. I mean, I'm into it, right? <laughs> I'm loving that. Um, so welcome, gentlemen. I know we're missing one person, which is it happens um, on these lives because we're live. It's a live event. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to inter quickly introduce you guys and um, and then we'll get into the interviews and the roundtable. And hopefully uh, Spencer will appear in um, virtual Zoom connection plan. So first I have uh, Dan Harrison. Welcome, Dan. And he is the head hunter of Soulful Sales Company. He is a course creator, which um, we all love a good course, an online, biz online business mentor uh, to intuitive entrepreneurs. And I love this because I love to speak into the intuition of business, um, which is an art form. It's something that you have to pull away from and really embrace. So I'm excited to jump into that because that's where I'm at right now in my business is really honing in on that. Um, and Andy Grant. Hi, Andy from Real Men Feel. <clears throat> uh, Andy's great. I interviewed him before for another program and he's just awesome. He's doing beautiful work um, out there speaking into men um, and men's um, right to be emotional and right to like, I don't know, sometimes it feels like there's so much judgment on the men. Like how do we really, you know, just have that um, space for them, space for men. So I'm excited you guys are here. I'm going to start with Dan. Dan, if you want to unmute yourself and then we can start this uh, interview, which I'm excited about. So introduce yourself and tell us, you know, about your work and who you work with and, and really what is this uh, soulful selling? What is that? Yeah. Well, would ha be happy to. Thanks for inviting me on the panel, Amy. Appreciate the uh, opportunity to connect with you and your audience and, and share about what I do. Um, so, um, let's see where to start. Uh, soulful selling. <clears throat> so maybe I'll start with a little story just for context. Okay. Uh, basically the long story short, uh, when I was 21, I had a brilliant idea to be a land developer. Um, this was in 2007 and I walked into the bank with this idea and they gave a 21-year-old kid a half-million-dollar line of credit. Uh, that project bombed, uh, and I was left with a half-million dollars of debt in the beginning of 2008 um, and not really sure what to do. And so I went into the bank every weekend just trying to not go bankrupt. I was in there so much they eventually gave me a job, and that launched my career in finance. Uh, that I stayed in for 10 years. I became a certified financial planner. Uh, I did eventually get out of debt. And um, about four years ago, I, I, as I learned the system from the inside out, uh, I, I came to understand that the, the system is not set up for the everyday person to win. And so uh, I went online, created an independent practice, and started to teach people about um, yeah, like how to take control of their own finances uh, as an independent fee-only advisor. And uh, in that process, built courses, figured out how to build a business online. And uh, truthfully, I've always been better at sales than financial planning. And so I dropped the financial planning and, uh, and now uh, have a business that's helping entrepreneurs, coaches, intuitive entrepreneurs, uh, build amazing programs and offers and uh, grow their business online. 
And Soulful Selling is the culmination of about 15 years of uh, developing a way of thinking about sales, about relationships, about business, uh, about yeah, solving problems, my own first and then my clients, and, um, and probably also uh, marrying a therapist and learning some uh, you know, nuance around communication and being able to connect with other humans in a way that feels good. And, um, and yeah, and so that's, that's the, the quick, long story short and some context into what I do and what I speak about. Hmm. That's into uh, that, a 20, a uh, half million dollar loan at 21. Wow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so can you, uh, <clears throat> so the intuition, talk about the intuition part. Cause I know, uh, we often, what is it to you? Like, what's your definition of it and tell us what you believe it is and what it looks like and then how it relates to business selling relationships. What happened when I go that? Yeah. So the cool thing is, uh, throughout my journey, so money has been, uh, maybe one of my longest relationships, uh, that I've had with, with money, you know, um, and navigating that, trying to understand money. And, and so to me, uh, money is an invitation into a self-exploration and, and, uh, as a financial planner, it was just, you know, your own money, but as a business coach, it's like your business and essentially does it, whatever's showing up in your life, in your personal finances or in your business is a beautiful invitation to explore something that's going on internally because the external is just an expression of the internal. And so, um, the intuitive entrepreneur is kind of these two elements where the entrepreneur is the external manifestation and creation of a business and the intuitive element is the continual inward exploration and understanding of self. And as we integrate those two understandings, as we understand how to build something out here in the world and integrate our shadow, our inner self, our, uh, and understand ourselves better, we become a more integrated business owner and are able to create a bigger impact, bigger income, bigger influence, uh, and, and such. And so the intuitive element to me is, um, is, uh, hard to put words around. It's that infinite aspect of self that is, um, a beautiful, mm, words always fail me trying to, trying to define the divine. So, uh, yeah. In intuition though is like my favorite definition of it, I guess would be Wayne Dyer. And he always said, uh, you know, if prayer is us talking to God, intuition is God talking to us. Yeah. And um, and so, yeah, that would be my definition of that, I suppose. Yeah, because I will tell you as a, um, <clears throat> you know, I've been into my business for the last two years. So brand new, still new entrepreneur. And uh, the hardest part, I think one of the most, the biggest struggles is you're doing, 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 mm. right? Uh, because that's what people tell you to do because you're brand new, right? So you're just like, okay, I'll just do this because they tell me to do it. Mm -hmm. And um, But there comes a point when you need to really take ownership and, and get into what really is going to work for you, right? Mm -hmm. 100%. And um, so how can we start making those shifts? Because... I think it shows up and I'm just going to give you some symptoms. It's like overwhelm or what, you know, can you speak into that? Like mm -hmm. you hit the, <laughs> you're like, you're like racing a hundred miles an hour as an entrepreneur, brand new. And some, so, you know, what, what do you come up against? And then how, how to really slow it down and get into centering into your intuition? Yeah. I wonder, I, I wonder if that is part of the initiation or the initiatory process of entrepreneurship. Like, uh, like it's almost a requirement or a rite of passage to go through the stage of total chaos, overwhelm, not knowing what to do, hustle, grind, all the things, um, trusting everybody except yourself, uh, to eventually get to a spot where, um, 
you have enough knowledge about what's worked, what's, what hasn't worked to come up with your own systems, philosophies, processes, and create something that's really unique and remarkable. Um, but in the beginning, uh, what's important is, is to maintain, and by no means am I a master at this. I, I'm like, I still struggle with this all the time. Um, but it is to uh, remember that like you, your, own, your business will only be as good or as effective as you are. And so if you don't take care of yourself, if you don't um, take time to create some space in your life to have fun or to, um, to like get clear on what you're doing, that will just show up in your business. And, uh, and so if things are like, if you're overwhelmed and feeling like fraying on the ends and not knowing what to do, um, confused, like that's your business trying to tell you something. Uh, that's your business trying to say, hey, um, take a break. Like go walk in a forest for a bit. Um, get grounded and, uh, and, and start fresh. Yeah. So... Yeah, but I, I, yeah, I totally get that. I don't know if it, it goes away. I, I think, uh, again, this is probably influenced by my, uh, by my wife, but it's, it's like when you're in partnership, in relationship, um, you know, things like boundaries are important. And it, I always, I'm like, yeah, I should have boundaries in my business. I should have boundaries with my um, uh, and be able to honor those, and, like my time and, and so it, it is a relationship, you know, like being an entrepreneur, you have a relationship with your, with your business. So, um, yeah, it's like being able to listen, I suppose, what your business is trying to tell you. Yeah. Because sometimes we're trying to tell our business what we want to, it does, <laughs> like, I'm just saying we get so focused on like, we, we want this thing to produce for us. Mm -hmm. And it's really more like switching that uh, energy, right? Yeah, it's like a, it's a, it's a both end. It's like, can you be um, persistent and patient at the same time? Can you hold the, 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 um, the polarities? Uh, you know, cause you, it's like, you are a driving force and a creative force and you are, um, and often things take time. Um, so I was, just, I was listening briefly to the panelists before, and uh, I, I heard a little bit about you know, masculine and feminine energy. Mm -hmm. And I find that that is a great correlation into business as well. Like your business, if your business can be integrated like you, uh, where you can have choice over whether or not you're going to be in your masculine or be in your feminine and you actually have choice, then, uh, then you have more control of your, um, of your business and your ability to produce results. But it's, that's why it is your business can only be as effective as you are. And so in, in my world, those two things are just very connected. Yeah. So what would you suggest if the, um, you know, you're, it's been a while and you're putting the effort in and you're not uh, manifesting what you want. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what would you suggest someone like that would do it to, to kind of like, it sounds like it might be a reassessment of something, but how, how, you know? Yeah, I, I would say, okay. Like a couple thoughts come to mind. One of the common issues that I see with people is they don't have the right offer. So they're trying to sell something that nobody wants, or they're trying to, or they don't know how to communicate what they do. Uh, and, and so they really need to get clear about what the market actually wants from them. And, uh, you know, when, when I work with my clients, um, you want to like business is about solving problems. That's why I love business. I love entrepreneurship. The best entrepreneurs are the ones solving the biggest problems out there in the world. And let's be honest, there's no shortage of problems in the world. So there's literally no shortage of abundance and possibility in the world. There's, there's so many freaking problems. Pick one. Um, 
And if you can, uh, but if you get really present, like if you can solve a problem for someone who literally like cries private tears at night before they go to bed, like, like it's that kind of a problem, you're going to be successful. But you have not done your job properly until you can cry those same private tears with them, like having that empathy that they are experiencing, that they're feeling. Because if you can feel that, then you can speak to that problem and they will buy. And, and that's, that's typically what I see as the issue when, you know, and, they're, and then they're forcing it and they're trying tactics and they're trying to do all these different things. But you can make it a lot easier on yourself by readjusting, realigning. And, um, and, and from a, if you take a st one step back from that, uh, from a, a paradigm perspective, I would say that the, the shift that needs to happen is often one for, of trying to get something, trying to get a client, trying to get um, money or, or versus uh, being able to truly come from a space of just trying to give. Mm -hmm. And from a, so from a paradigm perspective, it is that get to give. And from an external business perspective, it is a offer alignment with your market. Yeah. And I think I just want to say out there to all you entrepreneurs who are new to this or many of uh, of us had many out there had us, you know, switch to online, let's switch to virtual. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, I just want to say, like, if you look at the very beginning of the Unstoppable You to now, it's like I've got like five, ten different titles. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm trying to figure out, you know, what I do. And the process of that was this. Mm -hmm. Right. So creating a vision and then figuring out who, what that is also, which might be a little too explode, you know, a little more kind of very big, um, like an exploration for me. You know what I mean? But the intention was to give and to to bring value to people out there. Yeah. Um, and so so important that you um, you started before it was ready. Right, you started before it was perfect, and you allowed. You, you just took imperfect action, and you allow your experiments and the feedback to shape the evolution of it. And then that's a beautiful thing, because um, it's like, yeah, our communities and the people around us offer us such valuable insight, and it's such a weird, you know, anything cool that I've ever created is is like this much of me and this much of everybody else pouring into me mentors you know i've stood on the shoulders of giants so it's um yeah that being able to take imperfect action take feedback iterate that's how i know you're an entrepreneur <laughs> <laughs> well yes yes i i am i've always been that like that thing uh but so can you um uh, let's talk about, so, I don't know. Did you talk about that? Like, because I am a, in groups of entrepreneurs, because when you are an entrepreneur, like you said, you surround yourself with other entrepreneurs and people like you so that mm -hmm. you can, um, really see different perspectives, see what's happening, not be alone. Right. And what I'm, I was going to say, what I'm seeing out there, and this is, I only have uh, women entrepreneur friends mm -hmm. that are, we're in these communities, these different communities, that, yeah, there's a lot of doing. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of judgment. There's a lot of overwhelm. And I don't know if that's just um, the feminine woman thing, or if you see that with men too, or what that, you know, what that is and. We, I think our biggest mistake as entrepreneurs is that we think we have to do everything. Mm. Yeah, that's definitely up there. Yeah. Um, yep, that's definitely part of it. Like, you know, first of all, I, I don't think that that's just a purely feminine thing. I, I don't know about you, Andy, but I'm like, yeah, I'm like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I like, just, I'd like to ask. Yeah, no, that's that's an entrepreneur thing. That's it's uh, it it transcends gender and race. It's uh, <laughs> uh, um, 
it is a, a way of thinking, really. Um, and uh, one of the best things that you, you know, I figured this out when I was being a financial planner is as a financial planner, I was doing, I was self you're self-employed. And so you're doing everything. You're the sales, you're the marketing, you're the admin, you're actually doing the presentations. You're, you know, you're, you're, and if you're self-employed or a solopreneur, that's the same for you. You're doing all of these things. And truthfully, I, I wasn't very good at like five of the six of those things. <laughs> and so uh, going through a process of figuring out what am I good at? What do I actually like? What, uh, why am I doing, why am I building a business that has me doing all these things that I don't like doing? And so one of the best things you can do as an entrepreneur is figure out, you know, what is your zone of genius? Meaning, what do you love to do? What are you really good at? And what does the world need? And the inter, the intersection of those points. And you, you got to guard your time and protect, um, uh, protect it to stay in that zone for as much of the day as possible. And, um, and that, that to me is, is one of the, that's one of the tricks to not getting overwhelmed. Um, and one other piece I'll just say to that, because it's easy to say, it's like, oh yeah, you know, here's what, I, what does that practically look like? Uh, again, it's a way of thinking first, which is, um, systems thinking, uh, being able to, to think of, you know, think about the tasks that you would have to do to make your business work. Uh, and then you don't have to do them forever. You just have to do them long enough to build a system or to know it well enough to train somebody else to do it and then let it be gone. And, but thinking in terms of systems actually gives you the freedom to then step into the fuller and fuller expression of your genius. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, so that, that's, oh, those are my little thoughts about that. Yeah. So, um, I'm a believe, yeah. I mean, I'm a believer in hiring people. I don't, I'm hiring people out on certain <laughs> things. Like the organizational aspect of this live is mm -hmm. all done through Jaya, who is awesome. I don't know if you know that, but you, you, if you recognize how how organized she is, and I and it, that to me freed me up from so much because then I can actually love this process more. Mm -hmm. right? Totally. And. And I've gone to such lengths of like having to do a PowerPoint, like hiring, you know, an art student that I was tutoring in mathematics. I'm like, can you do that for me? Like, here's 50 bucks. Can you do that for me? Like to get really resourceful with how can you give us some like ideas, like how to be really resourceful with really uh, finding other people to do it for us? Yeah, I mean, the coolest thing in 2021 is how digital everything has become and if you weren't digital before uh the pandemic like you probably are now or you've probably you're you're trying to figure that out and um and with that there has never been more genius on the interwebs with with people who have access um like that you can hire and, and people will happily there are so many people on Upwork, on Fiverr, on, um, on all of these different websites with great skills, great talents. It's like, why am, why am I in Canva trying to design artwork when I can get somebody to do it for 10 bucks and I'm going to spend an hour and a half trying to make some cool, like, I'm not an artist. I'm not a designer. So, you know, like there's just, there's never been more talent uh, available to us. Um, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree totally. <laughs> so, just being that person that's been on camera for an hour. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm still there. I still, I, you know, for me, doing stuff like that is very therapy. Like, it draws me in to my... Sure. It's a therapy, like, very therapeutic for me on some level, but there's a point. Giving it away, yeah. you know, hiring out is, is yeah, it's, it's helpful. So... What are some questions that you can start getting into your more of your like intuitions? Like what, what kind of questions can we ask ourselves to kind of like 
get more grounded in that and less out here because it's 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 a train ride it's you know you're in the very beginning you're just like ah so what are some like things that could slow us down so that we can really get back to what's important what we really desire and like how to like to me it's like a calming energy yeah it's uh it's tricky in in that uh like I often tell people like I help people grow their business fast and then remind them that the soul grows slow and that there's like these two kind of opposing forces. You know, uh, we live in a capitalist world, which is about consumption, production, move, move, go, go, go. But the soul works at a geological sp uh, pace, you know, the, the, the speed of a rock. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, which is which is great when you can um, when you can bring some of that energy and that calmness, that groundedness into a, a culture that is so driven fast. Like you stand out um, simply because you're a little bit, or at least what I'm fine. I'm I'm a little bit slower, more methodical. And it almost throws people off. Like, what? Where's all the hype? Where? I thought you were a business coach. Where's all the six-figure stat? Uh, um, but the questions, like to to your question, what are the questions you can ask? Well, it's the biggest ones that you can think of. Like, what the hell am I doing here? What, what is what is the purpose of my life? What makes me angry? What makes me freaking angry? What makes me joyful? Um, like, what do I need to do to not die on my deathbed with regrets? What do I need to do to die well? Uh, you know, like, bigger, deeper questions that have you get outside the li little version of, of ourselves that is like one little, you know, I, th I feel like that's kind of the issue is that, especially in like maybe Western culture or uh, it is even in like self-development culture where it's like all about the self, right? Like the, the self growth, the self development. And we kind of get disconnected from community. We get disconnected from, if you think of who you are, uh, you know, okay, maybe I'll tie this in with the unstoppable you. Uh, um, I know my time is running out, so I, uh, this might be a good, place to end it but it's like the unstoppable you is not the little version of yourself that you like is not dan it's not this version of dan the unstoppable you is the version of you that understands that you are nothing by yourself you are connected to your family you are connected to this community you're connected to this global community you're connected to the cosmos you're connected to an infinite source an infinite source and so um, whatever the questions are, it, when you can connect to that, you become unstoppable. You become a force in the world because everybody is operating from a paper thin perspective of themselves that they're like this much. And, and so, uh, you know, w what are the questions? Any question that might remind you of, of the, the greatness that you are, um, would be the questions to ask. And if you do that, if you do that, if you can remember who you are, I promise you, your relationships will get better. And if your relationships get, her, get better, your business will get better. And your impact will increase, your influence will increase, your income, like everything increases with that simple awareness. So um, yeah, that, that's, that's how in my small paradigm, in my little world, that's how I would step into becoming an unstoppable you. Yeah, thank you for that. As I say, I'm learning. I'm getting there. <laughs> I'm there. I'm like, okay, it's time now. Um, Me too. <laughs> all right. So I know you have a free gift for our audience. Can you speak into that? You betcha. So this is, this is kind of uh, kind of interesting. So when I first got started in the online uh, space, I had this idea. I was going to build a course 
uh, before my wife and I got married and went to, um, we were traveling Europe for our honeymoon. And I was like, oh, babe, this is going to be great. I'll build a course this weekend and we'll have passive income before we leave and we'll be able to travel for months. And uh, three years later, I finished the course. <laughs> so like the idea of building a course is just not as simple as I um, thought it was. But I created a course. Uh, it's called A Course in Conscious Wealth. And it is the, um, there are three, like, I've worked with Bob Proctor, mindset, it's not enough to just be thinking positive and abundant, it's not enough. I became a certified financial planner, still broke, still had a bunch of debt, not enough to just understand money. It wasn't actually until I also understood marketing, and it was the mindset, money, and marketing, and the understanding of those three elements that allow me to now write paychecks, like, like you can literally write your own income uh, if you understand those. And so A Course in Conscious Wealth is, um, it's, a, it's, a, there's, it's everything that I've learned around mindset, money, and marketing. And uh, I have sold it for $3,000 when I was working one-on-one -on -one with clients. And um, now I'm giving it away for free. Uh, and so uh, it's 70 videos, um, uh, a ton of great content and the invitation to the, the reason I'm giving it away for free is because what it requires, it's, it's not really free. It requires an investment of time. Mm -hmm. And so that's what the investment is. So you can take it and you can download it, but it requires a, an investment of your time. And if you commit to it and you engage with that work though, and you commit to developing a mastery, of those three things, I promise that your financial, your relationship with money will transform, your your business can transform, your ability to create income will transform, uh, and yeah, and so now you can get access to that for free. That's awesome! Thank you so much for that, Dan. Yeah, you're welcome. I'll be downloading it for sure. Yeah, check it out. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Dan, for that um, wonderful interview. And we're going to go to Andy Grant. Um, so unmute yourself, Andy, and introduce yourself and tell us who you are, what you do, and, you know, really, what are you seeing out in the world today with your clients? And I know you have a podcast, so you're, you're in it with everybody in community. Well, that's a lot. Okay. I, I <laughs> am indeed Andy Grant. And... Uh, after, well, really a decades-long battle with depression, suicidal thoughts, not loving myself, not thinking I was worthy, not knowing what intuition was, just really having a worldview that life sucks, then you die, I finally began to do the deep work, begin healing myself, realize who and what I actually am, that I'm not just this meat suit, that I'm not just depressive suicidal thoughts walking around in a meat suit, that I'm much more than that, and that I'm capable of much more than that. And in 2010, I took an energy coaching program to learn how to separate me from other people's energies because I realized so much of the depression I was carrying along was not mine. So halfway through this program, it was a year-long program, people started asking me if I was going to be a coach. I was like, what do you mean? Like, this is a coaching program. Like, oh, I thought it was a personal development program. <laughs> so I really kind of fell into coaching, but I've been serving people coaching uh, since 2010 as an energy coach, also an author, uh, speaker, suicide prevention activist. I do Akashic record readings, help people get in tune with their higher self, their inner wisdom, uh, the, the, the truth of the capital T about life and, and their lives. And about five years ago, I started getting this nudge that I need to do something just for men. I didn't need to call out the men of the world because the, about 90% of my clients have always been women. Women were willing to do the work. Willing, women were willing to look within. Women didn't doubt their spiritual side. Women didn't doubt energy, right? They're much more willing to explore, to expand themselves. Uh, but I knew that guys needed this. So I created this podcast called Real Men Feel. And it's not saying that, you know, I'm real, you're not a man if you don't feel. It's, it's real as in genuine, as in not being fake, right? Mm -hmm. All human beings have a full range of emotions, but we've been taught that some emotions are for women and some are for men. And men have been taught that, you know, their emotional range can be angry and peek at, Okay, like we, we demand and are entitled to a more joyful life than just being, okay, 
So that's what I'm about. I find that silence kills men. That's why I like to come on shows, on my own show, be a guest on other shows, and just talk about the things that most men aren't talking about because that's the only way to keep more men alive. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's so powerful that silence kills men. Can you speak into that a little bit? Like, how is that uh, coming up? How is that manifesting out, that silence with men? Yeah. If depression hit, hits men and women differently, for the most part, a, a, a woman is likely to feel sad, and you can see it on her face, and she'll express it, she'll, she'll share with her friends. A guy is more likely to withdraw, to clam up, to be quiet, to, to hide with booze and drugs, to hide out in actions, right? It's the... Men are conditioned to believe that vulnerability and authenticity are our weakness. And you know, men are really, we're, we're ruled by fear. We are so afraid of someone discovering that we hurt, that we, we question our worth, that we have doubts. The whole, the whole marade of masculinity is, I've got it all figured out. I don't need your help. I can do it myself, right? If I'm lost, I don't need directions. You know, all, all this nonsense that we've carried around for generations and generations. And it's what's killing men. The su suicide rate keeps going higher and higher. 75% of suicides are men. Men feel disposable. Uh, the, the world of force responders and soldiers, like it's, it's men first. Like men are ingrained that they don't matter as much. So if I have to act like a man, have to man up, have to put on this charade, which tells me who I really am isn't enough. It, it's, it's all that inner pain. And it, it feeds its own silence, and the silence feeds our self-destruction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's powerful. And I think that, um, you know, it's good for um, everyone to hear that because many people aren't talking about how men really feel. And I think women, that's always what the answer, the question we ask. <laughs> That's like the always the thing we want to know. How are you feeling? You know what I mean? Like, what do you feel? What do you feel for me? Or what do you, you know? So it's like a, so no wonder there's like <laughs> conflict. So yeah. can you speak a little bit about that? And yeah. Um, yeah. So, so men can't answer that question easily. Men, men, yeah. And watch language. Men will, well, I think I feel this. I think I feel that about you. Men are trying to think their emotions. Right? We've been trained to be logical, think through it. Um, th there's this distorted notion of stoicism. Right? I, I must master my emotions. And for too many men, that means deny them, stuff them. Every emotion is stored in our body and our energy field, and it will be expressed. And if you're not willing to feel, actually feel throughout your body, the emotion, when the moment it shows up, it'll be stored somewhere. It'll come out distorted ways. You know, it comes out as road rage. It comes out buried in, 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 a, in abuse and in ways you act out. It comes out in men unable to tell the people closest to them that they love them. So women who, if, just, if you ask, how do you feel? And you get a blank stare, like just realize it's a foreign language. So invite them to drop into their body. Say, well, if you felt something, I mean, what, do you feel for me when I ask you what you think about our relationship or anything like that? Do you feel it anywhere in your body? Is there a tightness, right? Does, does, your, your, does your left hip tingle when I'm around? Does that tell you you like me? Like, let, let it be an invitation to explore, not just think, because so much of our energy is mental only. Men try to operate by logic only. Um, but if you change the terminology, like what does your gut tell you, right? What does your instincts tell you? That's another way to invite people into the intuition and energy without using those words. Oh, I love that. So what's your gut feeling right now? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just practicing. Yeah. And ask her, <laughs> do, do, does your body tingle anywhere special when I'm near you? <laughs> right? Just you know, playfully ask around, but not just like tell me how you feel. It's like so abrupt. It's you really get that deer in headlights, like I because they honestly they don't know how they feel because they've mm. been trained not to. Yes. And it's interesting because uh yeah, sometimes we're asking at the wrong time. Like we're asking, you know, it's interesting because I think it feels like sometimes for me a balancing act with certain people. Like you, uh, and me as a woman, I because of a man's um, energy or he might be doing something and busy doing something. Like that's not the time to ask a guy a question when they're like. <laughs> Actually, it can be. 
Oh, it can so, be. Okay, yeah. tell me. So men will get more defensive with a face-to-face -face conversation. Like, okay. honey, honey, we need to talk. Like, uh oh, the defenses go up. They're, they're on alert. They're, 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 the, the fear triggers are there. Like, the flee. Mm -hmm. Men are better opening up and talking when they're doing something else. Then you're, you're occupying the brain. So um, men having a conversation, you know, throwing a ball back and forth, do, doing something else, um, even going for a walk, talking side by side to a man is much more better than confronting him face to face. Mm -hmm. Whereas women do better looking each other in the eyes, really having that connection. And, and this is not true for all men, but if you're finding this difficult, these are ways to, uh, 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 ways to approach the, hmm, the, the more stereotypical man. But let that brain do something, and then lets the rest of them soften up and actually have a conversation. So don't think you need their full attention, because what you end up getting is their full defensiveness. I think everyone, yeah, I think that's important. Very important to say. And Ryan in the chat box says, I know how it's like he knows how he feels, but find it hard to come up the questions when I have the opportunity to ask. So well, asking yourself or asking someone else? Sounds like it is about, you know, asking someone like their partner. Hmm. Like, um, mm -hmm. so authenticity I and vulnerability are superpowers that too many men don't take advantage of. So, if I want another man or if I want a partner to open up, like, here's what I'm feeling, like, open with a confessional, open with the softness. And most people want to reciprocate, right? They want to respond where you're at. But if you're like, you know, if you're coming off in anger or you're, or you're afraid of how you feel, so you put up a wall and then you're asking someone else how they feel, like that will be felt. That's felt in our energy. So if you want to engage in someone, ha be, engage with yourself first. So come at a softened place. Be, be willing to be open and truly ask. Like, I'm, I'm wondering how you're feeling, right? Just, just be light as opposed to tell me no, right? That, that's not a way to get to someone's heart. And I think a welcoming phrase in... Um you know, so many relationships is like, you know, I'm not really sure, but I just want to ask, like, you're not coming in with a demand, like you said. So, and you might be saying, you know, I'm not really sure. I'm feeling unsure about what questions to ask. Yeah. And that's being vulnerable as well. Mm -hmm. Like, I have no idea what I want to say, but I feel compelled to speak to you about whatever the subject is. Mm -hmm. Right. Open it. I don't know where this is going, but I feel like I, I just wanted to come talk to you. Even as a way to break the ice, even asking people out. I don't know what drew me over to you, but I'd like to get to know you more, right? It, it, you, open, you open with your open door, your authenticity, your vulnerability. It, it's, it's welcoming. It's inviting. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask you, um, in your line of work, you're the expert. Uh, do Because women say they want vulnerability in their partnership. But when we get it, are we happy or what are we feeling about it? What do you usually, what do you Most see women say, most women tell me that they want that. But then a lot of guys say when they give it to them, the woman shuts down. So know that what you're asking for is what you want. And, but once you receive it, it might be so new to you that, whoa, you're, you're taking it back. And an emotional man is not always emotional. He has the strength to be vulnerable, to share his wound, to share his hurt. And if you are, if that is new to you as a partner, you might initially have a fear from this. Like, oh no, did, did I break my man? Is he always going to be this emotional? Is, 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 you know, did I, did I crush him somehow? And it's just giving all humans the right to feel our full range of emotions. If something's always been pent up and now you let out, it might be going to the extreme to the other side. Eventually, we get back to that place of balance. Eventually, we are willing to feel our emotions the moment they show up. Then on the other side of any so-called negative emotion, there is joy, there is peace, there is clarity, there is calmness again. So it's only that it's like the longer you've been venting, uh, the longer you've been stopping from venting, the longer you've been storing all this in you, it, it can come out in explosive ways. It can come out in violent ways and oppressive ways. So, you know, I, I think most women would prefer an outburst of tears than uh, violence and self-destruction and alcoholism. So... Um, but just realize what you're asking for when you get it, it may not be what you thought. And also realize this moment, this this new moment for our relationship isn't the only moment we'll ever have. Right. The power of being authentic is a willingness to feel the full range. And what so many women tell me is that they want a space where they don't feel judged for being emotional. Well, men mm -hmm. need that same thing. And men have not had that. 
So you might be triggered and be, oh my God, what's wrong with this person? Because that's the kind of treatment you receive for so long. So it needs to open up on both ends, not ask questions that you really want an answer for. Then when it happens, don't decide, oh, that's not what I wanted. <laughs> and I'm just thinking of these preconceived notions that women grew up with and our expectations of our man and how when that vulnerability might come in, how it would maybe scare us and put fear in us like, oh my God, I have to take care of another kid or I have to take care of another person. I, I can't have a mental breakdown, or, you know, whatever it is. I'm, I'm just feeling what's coming up for me, like from a woman's perspective yeah. of, uh, I'm going to say an older woman's perspective, like not older, but like I'm not a millennial. So I don't know if all of this is changing with the younger kids and the way that they've been uh, interacting with each other and the way they've been raised. But, you know, our generation is, we definitely had the man does this, woman does that, you know, definitely. And to say that we, you know, that's not out there is not, you know, I think we need to say it. Yeah. Well, you just realize, does living in any sort of boundary or limitation feel good? Mm -hmm. I, I ask men all the time, I, I, where did your definition of masculinity come from? Did you learn from somebody that was happy or were they just passing on crud that they were passed on? The only definition of masculinity is yours. And if you're in a relationship, you get to decide it together. Right? But it should be your joy, your happiness. That's what tells you that life is working for you or not. And if it isn't, th throw those old definitions away. Get new terminology. Like you decide. Like so people don't really marry people. We marry our projections and illusions and interpretations. And then through a relationship, through a marriage, we discover who people really are. And that's the great adventure. That's the joy. If, if you and your partner are willing to do the inner work separately and together, supporting each other so you become each other's best friends and you use a, a mental breakdown, a, relation, a great relationship means both parties can have mental breakdowns and everybody's still fine. It's not that someone gets emotional like, oh, I'm out of here because that's the response for too many people. Yeah. Right? We're, we are emotional beings. Love is just one emotion and falling in love it, it, it's this illusion. We think there are two stages of love. Like I fall hap madly in love and I live happily ever after. And that's still in the background of so many people's belief system, right? Life is up and down and marriages, relationships, they run into walls. And I believe those walls are invitations to look inside. Healing the wounds together. We're, we're all walking around so wounded from our childhood, so wounded from our past. 90% of the fights you might have with your, with your partner are actually rooted in the past. That's so true. So I know your your um, your gift is the five stages of love, but can you speak like we have a little bit of time left? Can you speak about like two of the like a couple of the stages, like briefly, kind of go over? Because I know I think so many people, yeah, we fell madly in love, and now it's happily ever after. But there's a hmm. big gap. Yeah. <laughs> a so, big gap. so stage one is falling in love. That's the part most people like. That's the the funnest part. Stage two, you decide to make a commitment. You become a couple. This is like the newlywed phase. You're going to raise your kids. You're going to have to start a family. Stage three is where too many people stop and think it's the end. It's disillusionment. It's mm -hmm. discovering I married uh, a projection. I married an illusion. D disillusionment is discovering the truth, who you really are. All the, all the facades have burnt away. And too many people think, well, I got to go back and fall in love with somebody else. But the invitation is to go deeper. It's to grow together. And that allows for stage four, which is real lasting love, right? It's that you're best friends and lovers, that you're doing the hard work. You're supporting each other, going through your wounds. You're, as Dan said, you're allowing your soul to glow, not at a glacial pace. <laughs> and your soul won't grow if you keep going back to stage one. Like the, uh, the disillusionment time is often, it can show up as like the midlife crisis, that stereotypical time where a, a man leaves and gets a, a, looks for a woman half his age in a red convertible. But if he's willing to go through that, the bonds can be even tighter. There's, there's a resiliency in us that comes through that phase. So we create lasting love. And then stage five is discovering the power of two, that you're much more powerful as a couple and taking on missions and, and service and adding more purpose to your life by working as a team, not working against each other, not seeing each other as flawed, not wishing someone would, would change, but your growth, your personal growth and couple growth is really tied together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I love that because I think um, many of us hit hit that third stage is like I'm out of here. Because yeah, <laughs> most people they don't know it exists, so it's a shock. Like, oh, this must yeah. mean it's the end. But but between mountains, like life is mountains and peaks, and there's always that valley. It's like it's like the hero's journey. You go into the cage right at that low point or the third act in a movie before you can come back up. You got to keep going forward. You can't just retreat every time it gets tough. You just yeah. have a series of broken relationships and you aren't growing as a person and you're stopping. You're taking away the opportunity for your partners to grow as well. Yeah. So in the round table, I'm going to think of, I have a question brewing for the round table, but I know on like, yeah. So can you, uh, I'm going to put your gift in the chat box. And I know that, um, I know that you, you know, uh, yep, so, the, so my gift yeah. is it's the original article that my mentor Jed Diamond wrote in 2015. Mm -hmm. It's the five stages of love and why so many people stop at stage three. So give you more details, more resources. And I had the pleasure of spending this pandemic uh, mentoring with Jed Diamond. He's written 16 best-selling books. He's been doing men's work for over 40 years. Um, and he discovered in his third marriage, these five rules of love. Love that. Carmela says, oh my God, love this. My recent romance fell apart when I was lovingly sharing my feelings about being intimate. He had not yeah. had any relationships and bailed. Right, because he's ruled by fear. Yeah. So you, 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 when you, ah, it's getting men to recognize and open up, but that guy triggered runs. And that doesn't mean every man will do that. That doesn't mean that's the only thing men can do. That's the real thing to point out. But he's got to be willing to feel his demons. It's, it's not really a reflection of you. It's completely a reflection of the pain inside that person. Yeah, I mean, Carmela, you know, that's where you were at. You were sharing a loving thing. And I think it's, um, so yeah. So what's coming up for me there is like, <laughs> do you do that with your back turned to him? <laughs> I really care. You know, just making a joke, but like how, like. And that could be, right? <laughs> if, if, if those conversations happen face to face, it made even more. So you shut down. It's harder to shut down when you're kind of occupied doing something else. But it also depends mm -hmm. how, how recent in the relationship this was. Mm -hmm. And that's why I encourage, you know, open and authentic from the get go. If, if one person thinks, oh, I'm just fooling around. And one person thinks this is I'm looking for something to last a lifetime. And they don't ever share that. There comes a point where it's discovered and it's a surprise to both ends and it can fall apart. That's the disillusionment. Right. All that can happen in a weekend if you're really racing through it all. Or a Monday. <laughs> <laughs> in L.A. It could be a Monday. Um, so yeah, she's getting, uh, Carla's getting teary eyed hearing you say, it's not me. Yeah. It's, it's not you. And this is, I think, and this goes for everybody, right? When you share a vulnerable share, uh, can you speak about that? Like you share a vulnerable share, then what do you do with that? Well, you, I invite you to own the gift of doing that. Celebrate yes. your bravery. Someone else wasn't as brave. Doesn't mean he won't, you know, that's going to sit with him for a while. There's going to be, you know, you can, there's some deep thinking going on, even though he's not ready in the moment in, in that interaction. So I suggest to everybody, nobody apologize for being you. And if you being you make someone shut down and leave, well, thank God you just saved yourself months, possibly years of a bad relationship if they were never going to open up. Right. So authenticity can be a great, uh, you know, early defense system. Right. I want open relationships. I want deep connections with friends. If, if my emotionality is too much for you, great. I want to I know it in the first hour. Let's get this over with. Right? I've been no told one, no one should with you. themselves down to fit in with someone else. Be yourself. Be yourself. Be I the unstoppable that. you. That's right. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I love that. Thank you for that share because, you know, sometimes we, we feel uh, – God, it's really painful when you put yourself out there and someone um, reject. You feel like it's a rejection of you, but it's not. It's only it's almost their own rejection of self and um, yeah. allowing you, love in and, and openness. You won't be able to scale everybody's walls on the first conversation or interaction. Mm -hmm. People have to realize they have walls, realize they don't like them, right? So it all depends. But but I believe that any interaction, like, like Carmela, helped that man. 
th this will sit with him. He will stew on this. And you you made him better for the next person. Like he'll be more aware of the wall. And oh boy, keep he's gonna you can't fix a pattern till you realize you have a pattern. Mm -hmm. Right? We can't we can't heal anything we're not aware of. So any you know, quote unquote failed relationship, I invite you to see it as a gift to both parties <laughs> for what didn't work so that you don't repeat it. Right. So now we're gonna thank you for that, Andy, and thank you for your gift. And it is in the uh, chat box. Carmela, be patient. <laughs> so, um, so I'm going to popcorn a question in, and if someone out there has a question, um, put it in the chat box, and we'll address it. Um, uh, no, Ryan, you're not the bad one to bail on negativity. No one's a bad one to bail on negativity. I. Um, no one's the bad one. Um, <clears throat> all right. So let's talk about, uh, oh gosh, let's talk about, um, I think we talked a little bit. So let's, what is connection to you? Let's talk about connection. Like, what is it, uh, how does it look like in your world? Uh, you know, because sometimes the importance of connection, uh, is just not, grounded like what does it mean to have a connected life what does it look like what um how do you foster that yourself in your relationships um let's talk about connection because i think you know so many of us do feel un not connected and we do feel lonely or isolated which is uh what people always say they're you know they're isolated when i put it in the the survey, they say that they're lonely and isolated. So let's talk about connection and what it is in your life and what it looks like. Can we go to Dan and then we'll go back to Andy? So we, we can get your vocal cords warmed up again, Dan. <laughs> la, 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 la. Yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah, connection to me, I mean, what comes to mind is the word resonance. Um, I think I heard it like what is love it's like uh it's kind of like uh it's like a resonance it's like a same vibration it's a it's a compatibility it's a harmony and so when i think about connection i think about the felt sense of what that is like <clears throat> and the felt sense is a resonance and you can have that resonance energetically with people but you can also have that same resonance with a plant. Uh, you could have it with a tree. Uh, we're all just these energetic beings. So I think like, what does it mean to be connected? I think it means to be aware of your own uh, energy, vibration, and then the alignment and match with others, people and things. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Andy, so what what's your relationship with connection? How 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 has it grown in your life, and what is it? You know, what we all Tell long for connection. There's no doubt about that. And I think one of the illusions we have is that believing that men don't want connection, women do. Women want overly connect, you know, whatever. But you know, as Dan was saying it, yeah, it's energetic. A, a positive connection is is even a negative connection. A connection is a vibrational match. And th this is true in all of our you know misery loves company. Well, that's a connection. It's not a connection I really want to consciously be a part of, but every every emotion, every vibration, every energy aligns and matches. So that's why, you know, um, uh, 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 you can start laughing in a crowd and people will join later and they they start laughing too. They miss the joke, but they everyone's laughing and it spreads. So energy is contagious. So connection, positive connection, I find is alignment with an energy that you want to keep feeling. So you, we, we desire joyous relationship, uplifting relationships, supportive relationships. That's the connection that I believe we, we long for. Mm -hmm. And as you're saying that, what came up for me was like, you know, that idea of connection could be positive or negative. And I would say for everyone out there to start really go for the positive, like connect to the things that make you feel good and uplift you. And in my own life, it's like, connection is everything to me. It's, uh, it is because 
I've been uh, teaching dance for over 20 something years. And that connection of human to human is so, God, it's such a beautiful energy when you have it, you know, and I know we've been in, a lot of us has been living in the virtual arena. Uh, and so we do feel disconnected on some level. Um, and I think it's okay to acknowledge that. Like for me, I miss like being in person and teaching and having, you know, that energy. It is so important for us to have that connection. And and I would, I would implore everyone out there to, you know, start turning down the dial on those connections that are negative and not, not really supporting you and who you are and loving you and to dial up the connection to the people who, you know, who are showing up with you, with you in this experience. Um, so I just want to, um, I don't know, it's just sinking into that connection. So important. This is also this, um, the unstoppable use about being connected as, as we're all saying. So, and I know both of you are really into energy. I know Andy is an energy coach and I'm into energy as far as, uh, movement and really sinking in and taking, um, listening to people, but feeling people instead of like, so can, and I know you spoke about it earlier about many of people are empaths and, you know, when, when you are energy driven, there is that a thing of taking on the energy that's not serving you. Mm -hmm. And I know you spoke into kind of protecting, like bring protecting that side of you. So can you talk, can we speak into that? Like, how do you, cause obviously I'm feeling the energies and a lot of your work is intuition energy. Like, how do you, how did you turn down the dial? And like, how did you like, realize oh this is i'm taking this on so it's funny to say like anyone says that i'm into energy or i'm not like we all are energy every, every yes, one yes, of us yes. is the same amount of energy that's yes, whether yes. you're awareness whatever you want to call it it doesn't it doesn't matter but what what i find so many tools are our imagination like energy work is imagination it, it's images in motion and we can use creative visualization and i would i you keep mentioning dialing i, I would I guide clients and do this myself. Like imagine a dial out in front of you. Imagine it's the amount of love I'm willing to feel. And just like, oh, what is it set at? And just get a number, zero to 10 or zero to 100. And then mm -hmm. can I turn it up? Oh, I feel something. Wow. Can I turn it down? Oh, I feel worse. Right? So I'll teach people to use energy tools by going in directions they don't want so that they feel it. Right? Yeah. Just so to give them that the power. But I will consciously use shields and bar bar barriers and boundaries as as a kid, I was again. I learned decades later. I was empathic. I would be the kid on the school bus. I would just start crying, and in my head, I'm like, "Why am I crying? There's nothing wrong." And it was the depression and fear and anxiety of the whole school bus coming out through me because I was the easiest channel of expression. Because other people were like locked in and had their selves in control, and I I was like an energetic sponge. So learning boundaries uh, literally saved my life, and the tools that I now teach other people to to improve their lives. But I can imagine a row of roses around me. I do bubble work. If after a big session with someone, I'll create a, an energy bubble um, for both of us. All of my energy goes back into that. Anything that I gave to you, I pull it back to me. We swap them back, cut the cords. But your, your imagination is energy work. Your visualizations are energy work. You can decide, you know, whenever I stomp my foot three times, that means I'm protected and I can go into the mall. Like You, you just decide. You make your own rituals. Where we, we are divinity in action. We are energetic beings. And your energy will listen to you once you take conscious control of it. But too many of us are all these, these nebulous blobs and melding into each other and you're picking up people's crud and you think it's you. And that's how I lived for, for you know, a long, long time. So it, it's conscious intention, just like the connection. I want to I wanna consciously choose my connections, not just the ones to my story, not just the ones to people complaining on social media, right? We long for connection. But so use your conscious choice and use your imagination to picture a life you want to live and then decide to step into that. Thank you. Yeah. I love that. Uh, Dan, let's talk about that. Well, I think that's a, that was awesome. I like that idea of, uh, um, yeah, like, I don't know if, uh, 
if I have much else to to say, the only other thing that like came up around boundaries, around like how to protect uh, energy, um, is like I find the more solid I am in myself, um, the more that those boundaries almost naturally occur. Like, so so the more I get clear on who I am, what I stand for, what I won't stand for, what are my non-negotiables, what is my vision, what is my, what is my, you know, what, where are my lines? Uh, the boundaries seem to, like, and people, we, I believe, you know, we teach people how to treat us. And we do that with our boundaries. And, um, and so, <clears throat> Yeah. Uh, the only other thought that's kind of in my head around this that you jogged loose, Andy, was uh, um, something that I've been playing with is like like archetypes um, and uh, being able, kind of being able to step into uh, a new way of being to facilitate, you know, to have a certain experience. Um, which is just imagination, right? Like I was, I was running a couple months ago around a track. Uh, it was a sunny day and I had this, I don't know where this came from, but it was like a thought of Eros, like the, um, uh, he's like the Cupid uh, the archetype, but he's, yeah. yeah, the lover and he's like a, like a, a warrior and, and I imagined him as a, as a fit stud <laughs> and, uh, I have never ran faster around a track <laughs> that, like ever in my life. And, and it's like, so just kind of playing with these uh, energies or these imaginations that give us access to, you know, new levels of performance, new ways of being new, new ways of show. But in order to, to, I think, get to a spot where you can start trying on different archetypes, <laughs> you have to, uh, you have to have a sense of self that is, solid enough to be able to like put it on the shelf for a sec and then put a different one on. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I find there, there are four main archetypes that make up masculinity. Mm, it's yeah. the warrior, the right. lover, magician, the magician and the king. Yeah. Too many guys, you know, traditional masculinity says it's just the warrior. Right. And we're so men are always at war, ready to fight. And it's just, no, that's just one aspect. The warrior is also the protector. The warrior is boundaries. Right. And the lover doesn't mean a doormat. The lover doesn't mean like, oh, no, they abandoned me. It doesn't mean you fall apart. It, you need all four. And the king can rule them all, right? That's the imagination. That's visualization. That's conscious control. Totally. And then the magician, well, there, there's the energy work that we're not sure that we all have, but uh, yeah. we do. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so it, too, many, too many guys, they, they, they hear like one cool archetype. Oh, that's me. I'm like, yeah. no, we're a balance. We're, we're actually, we're all of them. <laughs> right. And you step into the one that serves you most in that moment that needs that skill set, those tools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that. Can I be one of those architects? No. Can I do that or no? <laughs> you, you are. <laughs> you are. You don't. <laughs> it takes more effort to not be than yeah. to let it flow into you. Right. So, yes. And I, I want to chime in here because, you know, on Dan's point that, you, you know, you know, like knowing yourself is like almost a guarantee that you're you were going to have these boundaries set up. And I would say to people out there on a more practical level, like to get to where you can start knowing yourself a little bit more and to make choices is, you know, when you get off the phone with someone or when you leave a date with someone or you leave a party with someone, assess yourself. How do I feel? Was that what I wanted to walk away from with? Do I feel energized and happy and loved or do I feel drained, negative and upset? So on the practical level, like in your interactions, start questioning like, well, how am I feeling after that interaction? Um, and that's really gets you into um, getting more self-aware and what you are actually want in your life, number one, and making choice is that is that really actually good for me? Um, and I think that's a great place to start. If if you want to feel more grounded and you want to feel more like, okay, I want I want to be more positive energy and I want to feel better. Um, 
assess after each interaction. And that's even with everything. I do that with everything. Even going from the grocery store. Did I enjoy that process? What was that like for me? Was I fearful? Was I this? Was I that? What's going on? So I think um, I think that's a great place to start if you're feeling like I'm not sure about myself or what's, you know, what I, you know, I think we all want this thing. We all want to feel good, but um, often we put ourselves in situations that we're going to walk away feeling bad. And, and I, w I would offer to, to check in before it, not just after interaction, uh -huh. but am I, am I doing this yeah. because of the good feeling that I expect to come for it? Or am I doing something to avoid a worse feeling that I'm afraid of? Mm -hmm. Right. Because we, you know, you interact with a person, you go to a place because of what it what it brings you or what it keeps you from feeling. Because I find a, a lot of people are driven by avoiding their pain. So we just keep chasing different distractions. So that's really, yeah. really takes that moment to get honest with yourself. And do I really am I excited to do this or actually am I more afraid of if I don't do it? Something else, something worse is going to happen to me. Mm -hmm. And yeah, Dan. Oh, sorry. And Rebecca says, the problem with asking those questions is if you aren't in a healthy place, you can experience being love bond and feel amazing and miss the red flags. Yeah, Rebecca, I'm with you on that. And I always say to the women that I coach in that area of dating is to become the assessor. People say a lot of things, but really become the assessor. I, I really believe in that's my protection. It's like I'm entering this date because I date also, Rebecca, I'm out there. So I'm, I'm going into this thing like open and ready. And yet I'm not buying into everything that they're saying. I'm assessing. I'm saying, huh, okay. He said it. Didn't mean anything right now. You know, just having that a bit of a, a space, uh, might be helpful for Becca to think like how, let me just not buy into this. Let's just do a practice run and just kind of like sit back and hear what he actually is saying or she, I don't know if you're a uh, dating man or woman, but so then you can start. Um, yeah. Feeling amazing on a date. Yeah. I'm, I think I'm more of an assessor now. I feel amazing, but I'm in like a, <laughs> feel amazing before yes. love yourself so much before, that the, yes. someone else's love doesn't really alter you correct of course you love me i'm awesome not mm -hmm. oh i'm some this crippled mess oh good you love me oh i will cling to you further you 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 prove i'm lovable because you said you love me but as i said like you need to be a healthy place first but i i find the best time we are ready for a new relationship is when we don't care about one Right? We're, we're so content and at peace and loving ourselves that a relationship just, just adds to it. It's not something that we need that we're clinging to. And then that, that takes work to get there. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to add one more thing, which helped me also, is learning the types of communicators. So, you know, there's like the promoter, which I'm a promoter, uh, communicator plus an analyzer. But some people are the big promoters. They're like, get you all enrolled in this thing. But promoters have no follow through. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> that's one of our problems as a promoter. So I, if you want to email me, Rebecca, you can. I can give you those four types of communicators. And you know what you notice, like get a little more education because some people love to really speak a big game because they're excited and they're creators, but they often lack follow through. So. Um, yeah, I, yeah. I do numerology. If I was looking yeah. for a relationship, I would get the numerology of the person. I would get the life <laughs> purpose profile. I would, I would ask for them to take 50,000 different personality <laughs> profile tests, and then I'd analyze those results. <laughs> Andy. Oh my God. That's hilarious. Well, we did it, gentlemen. I mean, uh, I'm excited. This was an, such an awesome um, time with you. I know we're supposed to have a three speak, uh, third speaker, but his... He lives out in um, a really beautiful, I don't know, area that doesn't have a lot of uh, people around him. And there was a storm, so no internet. 
So unfortunately, we missed his interview and his insights um, because he would have been great on this panel too because he's energy and masculinity also. So it would have been awesome. Uh, but that being said, this was perfect. So I would love for you to give our audience one takeaway, one learning or a poem or a song, something that you know our audience can walk away with your words in their ears and their minds and their energy. Who wants to jump in? Dan's got a song, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> Dan's, ah. Dan's gonna break out a guitar. Yeah. I happen to, I happen to have a quote here that I was gonna speak to. So I, I think this brings me kind of reassurance again that earlier in some of the comments, it's it's not always just you, because we, all of us, human beings, mm -hmm. we are wounded early by people we love. And that teaches us to entangle love with our wound. Mm -hmm. And it's only through our self-work that we can take apart the wounding from the love and learn how to love another. Mm -hmm. so. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you for that, Andy. Dan, what are your words of wisdom, song? Poem? Can I just do an interpretive dance? <laughs> yeah, that's, you know, <laughs> as a dance instructor, <laughs> that is always encouraged. <laughs> uh, uh, well, um, yeah, I think maybe it's it's more like a, like a wish or a uh, yeah a wish or a, a prayer mm -hmm. for anyone listening, like to remember, like oh hold on. Sometimes when I close my eyes, I say smarter things. Um, yeah, I guess it would just be a wish for you to remember, like that you are beautiful, that you are whole, that you're complete. Uh, and underneath all of that self-work is, which sometimes clouds the vision of, you know, who you really are. But at that core, at that core, it's just like a beautiful, beautiful energy. And um, yeah, I, I, I wish for you to see that. And I, I was a reminder of myself to be able to see that um, in myself and others too. So mm -hmm. I suppose that's that's what I have. Beautiful. Yeah. You know, we can never be reminded enough to just slow down, take it all in and just love ourselves. And with that, gentlemen, I appreciate you guys uh, spending this time with us and you know, really just um, making us think. I mean, I think a lot of us in the chat box were like, I needed to hear that. <laughs> I needed to hear that. And um, I think that's it. We need to be heard. Hmm. You know, we need to be seen. So thank you for that, gentlemen. And um, say goodbye to everyone out there. And um, Thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Right. Be well. Thank you. Have yeah. a, yes. Have a beautiful rest of your day. You too. Yeah, I'll take you out of there. All right. Well, this has been an awesome first day. Tell me, did you, what did you, tell me, did you love this? Oh my God. Yes. Tell me your takeaways. What is one takeaway? I had the, um, you're welcome, Ryan. Tell me, I had the uh, speakers say takeaways today, but tell me, what was your takeaway from today? Like, what was the major thing that, that you, that you are going to walk away with from this live. Because there was so much great information, and I hope that if you missed the um, <clears throat> earlier speakers, you can watch the replay. And there'll be a replay in your inbox for the next three days after the live. Um, and what are you excited about doing differently? I'm excited about doing differently so many things. <clears throat> and in case you weren't here earlier, um, for the program, um, I offered my calendar link for you guys to book a call with me so that, you know, we can go deep into, uh, what you truly desire, you know, so I could support you in, in really moving forward in your life and your vision. Um, yes, I needed to hear that I did the right thing by honoring my nature by, because my voice is said he did. Yeah, you did nothing wrong, Carmela. 
and don't come into any relationship for the need. Thank you, Ryan. Yes, really. And a lot of the clients I work with, it's really about preparing. So I do a warrior pre preparation before I go on a date. I warrior up. Uh, that's one of my rituals, like Andy was talking about. I do warrior up before I go on a date so that I am truly empowered and I'm walking in like a breath of fresh air. I mean, like I am in my own strength. I'm in my own power. And I do that on the way to the date. I do warrior up, which I do work with a lot of energy and those visions, creating a vision for, uh, I don't know. Three ways to create a vision I do. So um, you're welcome, Carmela. Yeah, Matt, in, in order to attract a quality partner relationship, I need to be that first. Yes. Yes. And what a beautiful opportunity. And what a beautiful journey to put you first. It is a beautiful experience. And it, it, when you do that, it attracts beautiful people towards you. So I'm gonna put the link in for you again. Um, if you wanna, I'm an awesome visionary. So when you have a vision, I can really take you higher into what you really want. Um, that's one of my, um, zones of genius as you're speaking, I can see what's really possible for you. And as an energy person, it's like, I can really see that energy of that little girl, that little boy that's inside you, who's like ready to bust out and really create happy, loving relationships. So um, tomorrow's gonna be awesome. Don't miss it. And yeah. You haven't been on a date for 10 years. Yes. I didn't go. I didn't date anyone for three and a half years after uh, my fiance passed away. So I understand um, that space of time and learning how to get my voice back and trust. And yeah, I've been there. So um, yeah, because when you, yeah, you're building yourself back up because yeah, you want to walk into this new dating life and as being whole and being um, true to who you are so you're not shape-shifting. So when you walk in, the person looking at you sees you and that's like golden and it's such a beautiful um, experience. All right, so I think this um, concludes this time of the unstoppable you again my my link is in there i'm i have sessions open from today until i believe saturday for you guys um i always open up my calendar during these events because um uh because this is why i do the event so we can be in community and we can help each other so with that i'm going to end this broadcast and say to you that i you know Good wishes for you. Take a deep breath in of love and really take a breath in of peace and just know that you are loved. You are perfect as is. And dang it, I know you're ready. So let's do this thing. All right. So I'll see you tomorrow, 9 a.m. Uh, Pacific. All right. Bye.